Mr. Denzel Washington. But first, check out today's news in Popstart. We'll start with Kanye West. The rapper and fashion designer is the subject of an upcoming docuseries that's headed to Netflix. On Monday, the streaming service dropped a teaser trailer for the three-part event featuring footage from the past two decades of Ye's life and career. Here's a peek. I feel like he disrespected me, man. I'm trying to say I wasn't a genius yet. Uh, but who are you to call yourself a genius? Very rarely do you encounter self-contained people. This man can do everything himself. He living it. It's always like God saying, I'm about to hand you the world. Just know at any given time, I can take it away from you. Gotta love the humble nature of the title of the docuseries. <laughs> it's Genius. Oh. J-E-E-N-Y-U-H-S. The oh. Kanye trilogy is streaming on Netflix starting February 16th. Next up, Joseph Gordon-Levitt for the actor's latest role. He's stepping into the shoes of Uber founder and former CEO, Travis Kalanick. And in the first look here on Showtime's new series, it's called Super Pump, The Battle for Uber. Gordon Levitt stars on screen alongside award-winning actors Uma Thurman as Ariana Huffington and Kyle Chandler as venture capitalist Bill Gurley. Here's a peek of that. And contrary to what you might have read, I am not a monster. The notorious bad boy of tech. Are you willing to listen to wise counsel? I will always listen, but I will never take orders. Is this? legal <laughs> <laughs> the best thing about travis is that he is willing to run through walls to win Damn. the worst thing about him is he thinks everything is a wall <laughs> I'll watch anything with Kyle Chandler. Yeah, yeah, anything. Absolutely. Yeah. From, like Friday yeah. Night Lights. Just on. Like, anything. Move. I don't care what it is. Move. Come on. Yeah, it's fine. It's about trees growing. <laughs> Kyle Chandler's in it. I'm in. <laughs> That's it. In line. Uh, Super Pump is the name of that one. It premieres on February 27th over on Showtime. Finally, Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski. Man, this is friendship at its best. On Sunday, the legendary duo set a new bar of friendships everywhere. Going into this last Bucks game, it's a season ender. Gronk needs seven catches and 85 receiving yards. He needs both of those incentives. They're both worth half a million dollars each in bonuses. And by the very last quarter of the last game, he had already gotten one of them, but the tight end was still short of that other half a million dollar incentive. So what'd he do? He looked at Tom Brady and Brady was like, all right, I'm gonna stay in this game, even though his coach, Bruce Arians, is like, you better get out of this game. I don't want you to get hurt. He goes back and throws Gronk that $500,000 pass. Wow. Forget about MVP. What? Wow. Brady and Gronk are the ultimate BFFs. Wow. I can barely get my neighbor Matt to get my mail when I'm out of town. <laughs> <laughs> that's friendship right well, maybe there. Maybe if you offered him a half million. Oh, maybe. Oh, oh that's what it is. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's what it is. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Right. Looks good, guys. That's All right. Hey, there we are. There we are. And we've got a few more headlines for you after all this is Popstar Plus. First up, Charlie Puth, the Grammy-nominated singer, is making the internet a better place, sharing some kind words to one young man who was recently rejected from Juilliard. TikTok user Axel Weber posted this video on Monday, reading his rejection letter from the prestigious music conservatory, to which Charlie Puth later responded with these words of encouragement. Not only did I not get into Juilliard, but I didn't get into five of these prestigious schools that uh, I wanted to get into that I thought could better my career. We experience rejection every day of our lives. And as hard as it is to swallow in the moment, it's the thing that pushes you further creatively. So you, Axel, do not need to worry at all. I like your videos a lot. There's something very special about you. Well, that was pretty cool, Charlie Puth, to post that. Everything happens for a reason. And now Axel knows he's got Charlie Puth in his corner. Good for him. All right, finally, Chris Martin. Today, the Coldplay singer is sitting down on The Kelly Clarkson Show, revealing his favorite onstage guest who's joined him while out on tour, and also the surprising movie that inspired his career. Michael J. Fox came and played two of the songs from Back to the Future with us. What? In, in um, MetLife Stadium. And that, oh, my God. That was really wonderful. Him coming to play uh, Johnny Be Good and stuff, that was Oh my God, Wonderful. I remember that from that film. I thought it was so cool. Yeah. That's what made yeah. me want to be in a band, you know, that, really? that scene, yeah. Oh my God. Who doesn't love that scene in Back to the Future? By the way, Back to the Future shot just a stone's throw away from where Kelly Clarkson shoots her show at Universal out in California. So it comes full circle. Those are your Pop Star Plus headlines. When we come back, Zendaya and her Euphoria castmates are giving us a peek at the hit show's new season. Next. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. The HBO hit Euphoria returned this weekend for its long-anticipated second season. Folks anxious to see what happens to Rue, played by Zendaya, and the rest of the high school group as they navigate addiction, identity, love, and a whole lot more. The entire cast spoke with us about what could possibly be in store. If I had to choose three words to describe Euphoria, a lot of words that could describe Euphoria, but chaotic, funny, and honest. Painful, tiring, love. Listen, it's a it's a very different season, to be honest. I mean, um, tonally, it's different. Um, I think it's far more emotional than the first season. Um, I think it's got much like the film stock that we use this season, which is also different. Um, it's it's high contrast, meaning the highs are high, the lows are low. And when it's funny, it's really funny. And when it's painful, it's really painful. I think uh, they're in a kind of tough position just because after they're falling out at the end of season one, Rue relapses as we find out very quickly and Jules isn't in the loop and doesn't know. While they do like reconvene, um, there's like a lot under the surface that will most likely bubble up and bring the former issues to surface again, which is gonna be tough for them because I think like surface level feelings, they just wanna be like cute couple, but you know, it's, it's more complicated than that. I think Leslie is that tough love mom. You know, she loves her girls, she'll do anything for them. And unfortunately, she finds herself in the thick of Rue's addiction. And she she wants to save her daughter. But unfortunately, sometimes those situations, the person has to make up their own mind to become sober and to become clean and to want to be better. And I think Leslie is doing everything she can. So we see her kind of make some hard decisions. And I think I think Leslie is just your ride or die mom. She's like, look, we, we're gonna we're gonna get through this together. So Jules slept over last night. Yeah, so are you two in a relationship? Mm, yeah, kinda. I think with all of the characters, I am um, lucky enough or blessed enough to be able to to step in their shoes. I try to do just that. I try to become them and and really uh, try to tell their story. But with Gia specifically, I think it's just been us kind of growing up together where I was around 15 when we were shooting the first season and now I'm 18. But there has been growth and there has been more understanding of what Rue is going through and her addiction and her mental health. But 
Gia has to realize that she is human and she has the right to not neglect her own feelings and all of this. So I think we, we get to see her grow up and I've grown up with her. So um, I've just been been super duper grateful that I have been able to play a character um, that is so real and is so grounded and that isn't perfect. So um, I'm lucky. What if these are like the big moments in life? Like my mom always talks about how high school is like this big monumental part of her life. And I cannot imagine being 40 and looking back at this like, wow. I think one of my most favorite parts of playing Cassie, her choices are very unexpected. And I enjoy the challenge of going on a roller coaster with a character like that. So yes, it's a challenge, but I find that part the most fun. My favorite part about playing Maddie is I have a lot of fun with Maddie. I think she can be such a fun character, you know, when she's in her element and in her feminine power. I think a challenging part about playing Maddie is everything that she has to, just everything she has to go through is heartbreaking. I get a little too connected sometimes. The most challenging part about playing Ali is in the beginning, it was to not be seduced, to feel like you have to be a part of that bigger picture of the other craziness and all that, but I can actually be a bit more grounded. And I think to understand that that's my engine, it is not to play all these big notes of emotion and all that, but it's actually to be a bit more restrained. And so that was a challenge, to be honest. Every actor asks, w wishes to be written with such dimension and colors and arc for a whole episode mm -hmm. and calls on their, their strengths and calls on things that they feel very close to. And I think it was this great symbiosis actually, that great gift that Sam gave me. Um, and so that's been my greatest gift. And I feel like the effect of it has been a gift that keeps on giving on how it's affecting people's lives and people saying, I feel like I'm not alone. Or I feel like you reached out a hand to me or I listen to, I watch it over and over again, because it's it's going to my soul and helping me get through these dark spaces. So that's the gift that I've been given. It's an honor to be a part of uh, creating a piece of art in such a huge collaboration and every moving part, you know, it's just insane, the scale of, of what we're doing. It's a treat. Yeah. But yeah, you know, you can't even put that feeling into words. It's incredible. I feel incredibly grateful to me when people have come up to, to me at least, and shared their stories, whether it be of sobriety or other entry points to different characters that they feel connected to emotionally. That's when I'm like, you know, this, this is worth it. Like what we're doing means something to somebody and that's all we could ever really hope for. That's the point, you know, that's the purpose. And you can catch Euphoria Sunday nights on HBO. Coming up, we got the one and only Denzel Washington, right after this. We began our Cross America journey tonight. St. Louis, Austin, here in Nashville, from Washington, D.C., the side of our nation's capital you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> it was talking smack part of this. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Chuck Todd cast free wherever you get your podcasts. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. 
what's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. And welcome back. Legendary actor Denzel Washington is adding one of Shakespeare's most famous roles to his lengthy resume. The Oscar winner joined Hoda this morning to talk about starring in Apple TV Plus's film, The Tragedy of Macbeth. The one, the only, Denzel Washington. For his latest role, he is taking on one of Shakespeare's most famous characters in The Tragedy of Macbeth. This powerful black and white adaptation finds the star as the doomed King of Scotland slowly descending into madness. Take a look. Where got thou that goose look? There's 10,000. Geese, villain? Soldier, sir. Go prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. What soldiers, patch? Death of thy soul. Those linen cheeks of thine are counselors to fear. What soldiers, wayface? Joining us now, the man himself, Denzel Washington, up bright and early in L.A. Hey, hey Denzel, how are you? Good morning. Good, well, it's great to see you. So this role gets presented to you, the role of Macbeth. Did it take a matter of seconds to say yes, or did you have to ponder whether or not to take on this role? Uh, it, it didn't actually happen like that. Uh, 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 Joel and I have been talking. We've talked for a couple of years two, three years prior to, to shooting this about doing something together. So when it, when it presented itself, it was, a, you know, the answer was obvious. Well, uh, Mr. Washington, this is, we're going back to where it all started. Um, I was just digging through your little archives and I was noticing you played Othello back in your 20s when you were just a young man at Fordham. Uh, mm -hmm. You had a handle on the, uh, on the language, Shakespeare isn't for sissies. How did you kind of wrap your head around uh, the language itself when you were that young? Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know it was hard. Uh, it, was, it was a new challenge. It was all new to me. So it, it was just fun. It was, it was no one to tell me that I was, I was not very good at it. Was it like memorization or were you back then, were you kind of cognizant of, okay, this is what's going on here. This is what's going on there. It was more, it was memorization at first. I didn't know what they were talking about. I was just memorizing <laughs> the, the lines and, and the music of it. And what about for people who are watching and think, you know what? Shakespeare sounds interesting and Denzel sounds amazing, but I don't know if I'm going to grasp what is going on. So what would you say to a viewer who's curious? Read it out loud. Try it. Try it. Yeah, act it out. It's, it's not. It's not the boogie, man. You know, it's, it's just. It's. It's still English. Uh, you uh, and Frances McDormand. Uh, she plays Lady Macbeth. Describe what it was like working with her, because I know she's wanted to do this project for quite a long time. Just, I mean, the whole experience. She and and and, and her husband and and all the the, the young. Uh, uh, cast members as well. It was it was a real. It felt like a real theater company. You know, we all were in it together, and uh, uh, no ego. Checked out egos at the door, and you know, we all worked hard together. Denzel, speaking of young ones, uh, young Olivia, your daughter gets a has a moment in this in this uh, in this movie. Tell me about her role. Uh, if you blink, you'll miss it. <laughs> she, just a you know a small part in it, and uh, I, it was it was a lot of fun for me to be there with her. I don't know, maybe it wasn't as much fun for her, but but uh, Joel and Fran actually had the actors reading different parts. So when we were sitting around the table, you never knew which part you were going to read. So she never knew either. Some days she had to come in and read, you know, bigger parts. Now, are you kind of stage daddy when she's there? And I know your son, too, obviously, was in a couple of really big films, uh, Black Klansman and Tenet. Do you, how do you, how are you when your kids are performing? They're professionals, you know, and, and it, it, it's probably stranger for me than, than it is for them, maybe. 
but they're, they're professionals and, and I enjoy watching them, them work. You know, uh, there was a big loss that the world suffered um, when Sidney Poitier passed away, Denzel. And I remember when you were presenting him with his honorary Oscar. I remember watching that. Um, and I wondered just how now you've had a, some time to reflect. How, how did he shape you? I haven't had time to reflect. You know, we had a 40 some odd year relationship, so I'm still digesting all of that and uh, he he was the beacon he was the the, the you know the one we all followed and uh, it was an honor to, to, to be able to call him uh, a friend yeah. um, I was just asking you before we went on the air uh, where is your lovely wife uh, Paulette and you said she's already working out and I remember uh, she she's been on the Today show with me and I loved her the minute I met her. But I remember her saying that you never took a role that you didn't believe in, even when you all didn't have money, even when it was back in the day, that you had to believe in the role. Was, what, tell me about that part of your life. Well, it's, it, going back to my own children, I share that with them. You know, it's, it, it, it's the, it, saying no sometimes is harder than, than, than saying yes. So, so uh, I, I didn't have a problem with that. And uh, it didn't feel right to me, I, 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 would, I would say no. Well, I want to give a shout out to your lovely wife, Paula. She's got a beautiful voice. She's an actress in her own right and a beautiful singer. Uh, will you please send her my best too, Denzel? I will do. All right, Denzel, all right, Denzel thank you so much. Uh, Denzel, by the way, will be back with us on the fourth hour tomorrow, along with a few of his co-stars. We should mention the tragedy of Macbeth in select theaters now streaming on Apple TV Plus starting on Friday. Well, that was pretty cool. Always a treat to be able to chat with Denzel. Coming up next, we're celebrating another talented actor, Mr. Orlando Bloom. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Orlando Bloom, believe it or not, turns 45 later this week. And to mark the occasion, check out this conversation we had with him back in 2005. Kingdom of Heaven, the upcoming movie from the man who directed Gladiator, will put you right in the middle of the 12th century crusades. Orlando Bloom plays a knight bound for Jerusalem in search of redemption. This is a huge, big, visually stunning movie and a, a real epic in the in sort of the old fashioned sense of the word. Was it was it exciting, challenging? What was it like working on this with, of all people, Ridley Scott, who's got a pretty good resume, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I have to say for my first, this was really my first lead in a huge movie, Hollywood movie, and to be in the hands of somebody like Ridley Scott was amazing. Um, and yes, it was intimidating. <laughs> it was probably one of the biggest sets I've ever been on. Um, but it was, it was, it was really such a coming of age story and a sort of coming of age period for me as well. I mean, I'm still sort of six, seven years out of drama school and to have had the opportunity to have worked on this film so early in my career was just, it's just, I feel so lucky. I'm still pinching myself. <laughs> Tell me, why don't you explain briefly the plot so people will have some idea what the movie's it's about. It's basically the movie opens on a guy called Bailey and myself who is a man who has lost his wife. His wife and has child, committed suicide right? at the loss of their child. 
So he's really in this nihilistic state of disillusion. He just can't, he couldn't be more depressed and down. Um, he, he meets his father. His, he's a blacksmith, the first time. He's a blacksmith, way. yeah. He meets his father for the first time. And he, he basically... Played by Liam Neeson, Played sorry. by <laughs> Liam Neeson, the, yeah. very, the, fam the great Liam Neeson, who is such an amazing man and was such a great support and an incredible actor. He, um, he, he sets him off on a journey, basically. He's, he's, he's sort of a sort of, he goes on a sort of spiritual coming of age story. He's, he basically, he meets his father, he, he assumes his father's title in the Holy Lands, he falls in love with a princess and he becomes defender of Jerusalem and being a knight of the realm, a knight of Jerusalem. So it's really a huge epic story and it, um, which, which takes him from his homelands to the Holy Lands where he's ultimately there to find forgiveness um, for his sins and for those of his wife because having been a suicide in that time in that time of history she would have been you know she would have destined had her head, to hell destined and to hell. had her head, head cut, cut off, off. Yeah. prior to her burial so he's desperate to find forgiveness for his wife and for her sins and for his it is all about the crusades and and I thought it was interesting because it seems that religion is always a source or can always be a source of conflict worldwide. So, and, in, and, and, and it seemed oddly relevant, didn't it? When you look at the state of the world and, and, and people of different faiths fighting for territory, for all sorts of things, you think, gosh, exactly. it hasn't really changed all that much, right? Absolutely, and I hope that's the sort of dialogue that this movie will spur, because you look at it and you think, wow, the injury that was done thousands of years ago is what people are still really dealing with today. You know, it's like that, that wound that was created and that you know was inflicted that is the sort of the reason why two civilizations civilizations are still opposed today and uh, I think it should spur some very interesting conversation throughout so much of the movie Orlando you have to communicate by being non-communicative yeah. you know you don't have a, a, a ton of dialogue at no. least early on because you are very sort of torn up inside yeah. and, and and tied He's I guess really a reluctant hero right and we talked uh, at great length with Ridley about those sort of sort of old s spaghetti western movies, like the Sergio Leone movies. The idea of a of a of a of a guy who is has a, his own inner torment, you know, uh, those sort of really reluctant hero types. And he has a very much an inner dialogue as well as the external life that he leads. And he's really what makes him the hero is that nothing is for his own benefit. He is very much a man of the people, and he his his main objective is to find this forgiveness and to understand what God could allow this to happen to my wife and child and how do I live with that um, and that makes him this really sort of honorable man that and he's and he's constantly being told the Knights code of conduct be without fear in the face of your enemies and ultimately safeguard the people and there's a great humanitarian message in this movie because at the end of the movie it's about the salvation of the people of Jerusalem. It's not about the stones, it's not about the temples, it's about the people and I think that's a fantastic message to I walk out of. It, it is and I, as I said it was visually stunning but I have to admit Orlando I spent a lot of the time during the movie tell me when the stop, this stuff is stopping it because packs it's, a punch. it's pretty intense and yeah. pretty violent yeah. but you I mean clearly it must be quite realistic because those were not nice times, no, right? No, I think that's one of the things that Ridley Scott as a director does so well. He draws a movie, he draws a movie audience into that time and he really, through the horror of war, you sort of, it, it's what forces you to think, wow, how can we avoid this and what can we do to avoid this? Because this, this is um, real, this is what it would have been like and I was in a suit of armor that was like, it must have been, it, it was light because it was plastic compared this to what it would have been. On the other hand, this must have been terribly physically taxing because I watched this and I thought, boy, they must have been very tired at the end of the day. Before we go, I just want to mention you're on the cover of Rolling Stone. And do you feel like, gosh, I've arrived? And is it scary, exciting, or a little of both? Um, honestly, I feel like I'm still six, seven years out of drama school and I have so much to learn and so much to do. And I hope you know, probably many mistakes to make. Um, but I certainly feel excited to be on the cover of the Rolling Stone and to be in, starring in a Ridley Scott movie at this time in my career. But it's sort of, it's all sort of happened so fast and I'm just sort of really trying to keep my head down and keep it about the work and, and, and hopefully make movies that people want to enjoy and that are timely and feel important. And I think Kingdom of Heaven certainly is one of those. How's that for a throwback? All right, that's gonna do it for us. Thanks so much for watching today's Pop Star Plus. Coming up tomorrow, we're checking in with Fran Drescher. Until then, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.
that over the past year, four in 10 Americans have reported symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder, and that's up from just one in 10 back in 2019. Yeah, and our good friend Rabbi Steve Leader knows those feelings all too well and is here today to talk about a very personal struggle. Steve is the senior rabbi at Wilshire Boulevard Temple in Los Angeles and the author of an incredible book, The Beauty of What Remains. By the way, read all of Rabbi Leader's books yes. because, and read them with a highlighter because <laughs> they're full of life lessons. And I think that's what made this conversation especially poignant because you're a healer you're a helper people come to you and put their problems on your lap and you take them in and we don't ever expect the teacher to have problems um, right. in our heads at least and we think that you should but yet you were you were riddled with anxiety yes um, I've, I've suffered from anxiety most of my life I didn't always realize it because I, I was able to subordinate it keep mm -hmm. it locked in the basement of my mm -hmm. psyche through just an incredibly brutal work ethic my whole life. Yeah. I, was, I was raised in a home with an impending sense of doom around each corner, yeah. you know, a lot of fear. Uh, it's in my DNA. And my remedy, which I learned very early on from my father, was to just work all the time. And that subordinated the anxiety. And then uh, something happened in January. I think it was a combination of yeah. carrying so many families through COVID, mm -hmm. all of those funerals, all of that yeah. collective anxiety yeah. that was a part of my congregation, which you know is pretty large. So mm -hmm. it was a, a heavy load and steering the institution through. And then um, I, I made a decision to help someone privately who I believe deserved a second chance. Yeah it became public that I helped that person and some people disagreed with my decision um, uh, about whether or not forgiveness was merited. And then I had this, this rush of fear of, that I was gonna be canceled by my own huh. community. And this just flung open that door huh. <coughs> and triggered a, a paralyzing, paralyzing uh, ah. period of anxiety. I mean, we can see <coughs> in your eyes, we can mm -hmm. hear it in your voice that this was something that was debilitating and as Hoda said, you are the healer. Yeah, yeah. So how did you heal yourself in that moment? Well, it got so bad. I lost 10 pounds. Um, I, you know, was barely functioning. And I needed help. So I asked for help. I went to a very good psychiatrist. Uh, I got, for the first time in my life, the proper medication. Huh. And after a few months, I woke up one day, someone asked me, how are you? And I said, great. Yeah. And I said, who is that guy? <laughs> and, and I started to realize what a normal human level of anxiety is uh. all about and how much better my life was. And all I had to do was get help. Yeah, and yeah. speak it out loud to say it because what you said, which is I think a lot of people are doing right now is the, the carry it. You bury it and you carry it and you continue yes. because you're productive and yes. you have a happy family and you can keep going and going and going. Right. And there are some who would say like, well, why not continue? Like yeah. what's the harm in continuing the way you had been for Well, a long you can time? only keep that basement door locked for so long. Yeah. And then, you know, there's the, these underlying mood disorders are banging on the ceiling with a broomstick. Yeah. Get me and out eventually, here. eventually they come out. And, and then you start to realize the high wire act you've been performing your whole life. Yeah. To, to keep it under control and to carry it. And I made the decision to come out about this because first of all, uh, I believe in a whole system of beliefs that says we can change, that yeah. we can be better, that life can be better, that the world can be better. And I thought to myself, how can I not lead by example? Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of celebrities have come out about this, but we don't really relate to celebrities right. and see ourselves yeah. in them. Right. And so I decided to do it because, because anxiety plagues clergy, school teachers, yeah. Yeah. car repair workers, yeah. you know, uh, everyone. Moms and dads. Moms and dads, yeah. four out of ten. Yeah. Four out of ten of us in this country. And, you know, there's an aversion to getting help. Yeah. I need these because my vision's not 2020. Nobody cares. Yeah. If I had diabetes, I wouldn't think twice about taking insulin. Yeah. Mental illness somehow, there's, stigma. there's a stigma yeah. that's seen differently. And if we can just get past that and, and realize, as I like to put it, store-bought is fine. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> store-bought is fine. Yeah. We all, we all can change and, and have more beautiful and more yeah. 
meaningful yeah. lives. And also, uh, you know, you've helped all of us. Yeah. So many watching your whole your whole um, temple yeah. find the beauty in their lives, and yeah. we're just so proud that you let yourself find yes. that same beauty. I, I offer it to to all of us, and and you well, know, thank I you hope for offering it to yourself. Well, thank you. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. What Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. guest has a new way to celebrate yourself every morning. Right. Amel Robbins is a motivational speaker, podcaster, and the best-selling <laughs> author behind the high five, the, behind the five second rule. <laughs> the new book is called The High Five Habit, and she's here to tell us what that means. Mel, good morning. Thank good you. Good morning. Number two on Amazon. That's so right. Wow, congrats. Boom. So let's talk about this high five habit. In short, it's about cheering yourself on in all aspects of your life. Right? Yes. How, yes. Why is this so important? Well, first of all, the last 18 months, I think, has punched everybody in the face. We all <laughs> have higher anxiety. We feel uh, discouraged. We feel low energy. And so you have to know how to pick yourself back up when something like this happens. You need more positive energy. And this goes deeper than just cheering for yourself. There is so much science behind high-fiving yourself in the mirror that is mind-blowing. Huh. I started doing this because I was overwhelmed by my life. I was overwhelmed during quarantine and I couldn't think of anything positive to say to myself in the mirror. And one morning I just all of a sudden high five the exhausted, overwhelmed, tired woman I saw staring back at me and I felt this shift in energy. I did it for a month. I posted one photo online and more than a hundred people posted photos within an hour of themselves and with their kids of all ages, of all sizes, races, religions, doing it around the world. And I thought, well, that's crazy. Maybe I'm not the only one who needs to feel lifted up. So I did a year-long research project. The science is nuts, you guys. Mm. So let's talk about a high five. Okay. Yeah. High five people okay. your entire life. When you yep. high five somebody, what does a high five mean? You're saying, way to go. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Yeah. Yes. You've never high fived somebody and said, you're terrible, I hate you, you're a failure. That, right. That is it's true. a positive emotion, right. positive gesture. All of that programming is in your brain. Ah. It's already there. So the physical cues the mental? Boom. Okay, And I love so that. you can stand in front of the mirror and say, my life is terrible, I'm a failure, I, I'm ashamed of this, that, and the other thing. When you go to high five your reflection, yeah. the subconscious part of your brain overrides what you're thinking. And it programs with your reflection. I believe in you. I that. see you. I love you. So just, so, and it's not. You, just, you, just, you, got, you, got to, you don't even have to touch the mirror. A lot of people don't. Okay. Just look at yourself in the mirror for a minute. Okay. Oh because 91% of women hate how they look. 50% wow. of men and women don't even look at themselves in the mirror. Wow. That's sad. Yeah, yeah. that is sad. But when you look at yourself in the mirror, you're actually staring at another human being. And everybody has a habit right now that is to pick apart or ignore the human being they see. Mm -hmm. it's true. I want you to break it. And so you just look at yourself and think, how do I need to show up for that human being? And then just raise your hand and high five your reflection. Honestly, you, I feel it, I do. I know what you're talking about and I will say I was just at a playground in Philadelphia with a bunch of kids and they were doing this like planned recess where every time you lost the game, right? Yeah. Like, so you're out, you get tagged, whatever. You high five the person and the other one tells you you're awesome. Even though you're out, 
it's just like an uplifting feeling. Well, you know why? Because every time somebody else gives you a high five, your brain releases dopamine. Mm. And your nervous system gives you a jolt of celebratory energy. This comes from Dr. Daniel Amen, the world's leading expert on the brain. On top of that, there's research about kids. The most motivating force in the world when researchers studied how to push kids through a challenge yeah. is not to tell them they're smart, not to tell them to work harder. It's to give them a high five with no words. Because when you high five a human being, you're saying, I see you, I believe in you, I love you. That's what it's communicating. No, well, I'm, going to, I'm going to fist time because it's, no, it's the five. same reaction too. High five. It's incredible. <laughs> the high five habit <laughs> is out now. When Christina Di Fiore was a high school sophomore, her life was consumed by schoolwork and competitive dance. I would come home exhausted and then I would shower right away, eat some dinner, try to cram in a few hours of homework. By that time, it would be midnight and do it again the next day. And after she sustained a back injury, her life was suddenly turned upside down. I would just say, is this ever going to stop? Is this ever going to get better? And I was afraid she would have to give up dance, um, which she loved. I was afraid that she would sort of lose her passion for school. Sidelined from her passion and her schoolwork floundering, Christina was depressed and struggling. It came down to the fact that really she was suffering from some anxiety. And she's not alone. 17% of kids ages 6 through 17 experience a mental health disorder. Adolescents, teens are going through a lot and reporting a lot of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, suicides. All of this is increasing rather than decreasing. And now some states and school districts are taking action, allowing mental health days as an excused absence for students. In the same way that if you were to experience a stomach ache or a headache, it's going to be incredibly hard to focus in the classroom. The same is true for our students who are experiencing anxiety, who are experiencing depression. They're so distracted. At the forefront of the Mental Health Day movement is former Oregon high school student Haley Hardcastle, who's battled anxiety and depression for most of her life. Outside, I'm like a really overachieving, um, well-adjusted student, but I definitely go through my own struggles. I started my mental health journey when I was only six years old. Her TED Talk on mental health days garnered more than 2.8 million views. Some semesters, I used all of those rest days to the fullest. And in the past two years, Oregon, along with eight other states, have enacted laws allowing mental health days for students. My goal is to make sure we increase the mental health illness awareness um, throughout our communities, no matter what your background is, no matter where you live. The National Alliance on Mental Illness encourages students who feel they need a day off to use that time to rest up, find an activity that brings joy, and seek mental health support. It was a great opportunity to spark a conversation with friends and family about what you're going through. As for Christina, she's now a senior applying for colleges, and she says she's doing much better. She still sees a counselor regularly. She's like, Christina, sometimes you just need to slow down. And I need to hear that from multiple people multiple times to actually take it in. But it is something that's very, very crucial to well-being. So how can we help our kids? Dr. Harold Koplowitz is the president and medical director of the Child Mind Institute. He's also the author of the book. It's called The Scaffold Effect. Good morning. So glad to have you here. I think a lot of parents may be watching and wondering, like, I'm not sure if what my child has is a serious thing yeah. or just a moment in time. Mm -hmm. And they don't know whether they should be carving out mental health days and seeking counseling or if it's just something that kids go through and can blow, blow over. So pre-COVID, yeah. 17 million kids in the United States had a mental health disorder. And the first or the most popular one happens to be anxiety yeah. disorder. So it's not just being anxious, it's distress and dysfunction. I'm so uncomfortable that my skin is crawling, yeah, or I, I can't stop washing my hands right. even though once was enough, or I can't separate from mom and dad. Yeah. COVID has made it worse for everyone. Okay. So for anxious kids who now have to go back to school and have to separate from their parents, have to put up with social interactions when they were super sensitive, maybe even pathologically self-conscious, this mm. is really tough for a certain mm. percentage of kids to go back to school. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of us who are delighted to be in person, right. in the studio, in school, hanging out yeah. with my friends. 
but for a certain percentage, yeah. that 17 percent or 20 percent of the population, they're going to struggle. Mm -hmm. So we just talked about this mental health day. I, my mom actually gave us those days when we were younger if she just saw that we were exhausted. Yeah. What do you think about the fact that school districts are taking this on? Yeah. Well, I think a sick day is a sick day, right? I mean, one of the psychologists on the piece said, if you have a stomachache or you have, yeah. have a headache, you're entitled to take the mm -hmm. day off. And certainly, if you're so demoralized or you can't get out of bed, what I worry about is that if you're avoiding something. Yeah. So for instance, if you are avoiding separating from your parents and your parents let you stay home, mm -hmm. you're feeding the monster, so oh, to speak. The anxiety is going to get worse. So that's the telltale sign. Is this just avoidance or is it he can't get out of bed? He's just wiped out. Mm -hmm. And is this a sign, by the way, that it's more than just a little blip? Should I need to go see a mental health professional? A lot of kids are going through horrible anxiety, and a lot of it is social media sparred. Yes. I mean, I get it. Like, yeah. if your friends are either making fun of you or they're leaving you out, taking a mental health day and being you away, can't escape it. yeah, it's always up in you. So, what? How, how do you combat that piece right. of it? So, we did a study during COVID yeah. about problematic internet use. Kids who use the internet six to eight hours a day. Yeah. Uh, and believe me, during COVID, kids were using it a lot more yeah. than that. However, it turns out that if you had ADHD or depression beforehand, yeah. you made your symptoms worse. You have a statement that says self-care is child care. Jen and I were like, <laughs> yeah, yes. For parents, but if yes. you're coming in depleted, you're not going to be able to meet, meet the building. Well, they well need it's the whole idea of being a scaffold, right? If the scaffolding isn't strong, you can't make the building strong. Four things I want everyone watching okay. to do. Sleep at least seven hours a night. Okay. That means turn Netflix yeah. off, stop yeah. looking yeah. at your Go to bed. screen. Number two, eat something green, yeah. okay? Yes. Too many carbs, not yeah. good for you. Yep. Number three, do some exercise, even if it's just a 20 minute walk. Yes. You don't have to be fit, super fit. And third, do something spiritual. Yeah. So by spiritual, go to church, go to synagogue, or just sit meditate. and meditate. Do mindfulness, do calm. You know, it doesn't make a difference whether it's five minutes that grows into 20 minutes, but take that moment. And yeah. that's great modeling for your kids. If it's, your kids see you doing that, they're more likely to boy, do that's it. All yeah. great. That's I know good. this was such good yeah. advice and your book is filled with so much more. Thank you so Thank much. You. So to check out his book, The Scaffold Effect, head to today.com slash shop. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? What's going to happen? Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news for hours until the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just fits. for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin. Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? This makes me happy. Known for his over-the-top handcrafted masterpieces. All right, give me the buttercream, what's ISIS? Cake Boss star Buddy Velastro stunned fans last September when he posted this photo from a hospital bed with his hand heavily bandaged. Hey guys, Buddy here, and uh, I had a really bad accident the other day at my house with my hand. What happened with your husband? I don't know! Something with the bowling alley! He's stuck! 
while bowling with his family at home, Velastro tried to correct the machine's pin setter. My dad was standing right here. He was trying to fix it, and his hand got pinned up against here. His right hand became jammed and was impaled multiple times by a metal rod. He recounted the incident and his first two surgeries with his son last year on Today. It's going to definitely be an uphill battle, and the prayers and the support from all the fans from all over the world has been, you know, made me feel so special, and um, it makes me want to fight to get better for them. You know, it makes me want to um, be the man that I was. Now, five surgeries, and more than a year later, the cake boss says his dominant right hand is at 95%. He came out pretty amazing. He even competed in and won a new season of his competition show, Buddy versus Duff. Somebody up there is watching me. The star baker documenting his road to recovery across social media. You know, I really can't squeeze or grip things too much. Which has been anything but a piece of cake. <laughs> Joining us live is the kick boss himself, Buddy Velastro. Buddy, God, it's good to see you. It's good to see you working back in business. Was there a time back there during this time where you wondered to yourself, I wonder if this injury may be a game changer for me where I wouldn't be able to work anymore? Oh, I, absolutely. And again, guys, thanks for having me. But, you know, laying in that hospital bed after I had that surgery, I spent two days in HSS and I really had no, I couldn't feel nothing. I really had no idea what I was going to get back to. You know, I, at that point, I don't think the doctor even knew, you know, um, it was, it was like really scary because that's part of me that I call my inner child. Right. When I when I think about cake boss or I think about these cakes that I make, I think that anything in the world is possible. And then I go and make it happen with my with my hands. You know, this is what I do. And um, I felt like part of that I might not ever be there again. You know, um, it was tough. It was it was not probably until February where I had five surgeries. And thank God for Dr. Carlson and HSS. Um, and Dina, my occupational therapist, worked with me for five months, day and night, to like really get my hand back to normal. But I couldn't make a fist until the middle of February. Now, I was supposed to film Buddy vs. Duff in April. And I said, look, my team was like, Buddy, you still got to do it. Even if you can't do it, you know, all in with your hand, we're here to support you, you know, and you can be more of a coach. Um, but I went in and, and thank God I feel I'm about 95% back. I don't think I'm going to be a hand model, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and, and I might have to get another surgery, um, over time, but you know, I mean, considering what happened, I mean, I had a huge metal spike through my hand. Mm. The fact that I'm here talking to you guys today, doing what I'm doing, um, and, and listen to technology because it. I had nerve damage, and she repaired the nerve. These fingers here, for like a year, mm -hmm. I just felt like tingly and asleep. Mm. But now the nerve is starting to regenerate, and it actually feels like back to normal. It's so crazy mm. what we could do today in, in technology. And, and you have such a different respect for the doctors. Not that I didn't love and respect them before, but when it, when it happens to you, you just – think of all those people who helped you get where you are and, and recover and and through COVID I mean they really were, were truly heroes so um, yeah. hats off to the you know the whole all the doctors and nurses and everybody in that industry who really uh, put the put you know us first all the time that's great. Yeah. Good to see you, buddy. buddy thank you so much for Congrats, joining man. us. We're happy you're back in business. Yeah it's good to see you. Take thank care. you. Great to see you guys. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs>
Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? week-long journey across America from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Back in 2017, news of Bob Harper's heart attack. It's pretty shocking. He was the personal trainer on The Biggest Loser, and he went into cardiac arrest while he was at the gym. Well, now Bob is sharing a powerful and personal project. As part of the Survivors Have Heart program, Bob has taken portraits of those who also had heart attacks. And this is, this is just a, a first look at some wow, of these portraits beautiful. before they're displayed publicly uh, here in, in New York City in October. Uh, Bob Harper, good to see you, brother. Welcome back. It's good to see you. It's so exciting to see those photos um, yes. out in real life. Like, you guys are the first people to see these photos today. And then, now our audience as well. Yeah. And we've just shown some of these portraits that you've taken for Survivors Have Heart and AstraZeneca, for whom you are a paid spokesperson. What can you tell us about the two other survivors here? Well, what were you trying to portray in the pictures? Tamika and Tasha, they were such good subjects because they came in, and what I wanted to do is really show the power in these women, the, the hope for, uh, for a heart attack survivor right now. Can, they can see these photos and think, you know what? There is life after this. If I've survived this heart attack, I can have a full life that is strong and happy and fulfilling. Yeah. I mean, these women really showed that. And that's what I wanted to capture in the photos. My photographs can tend to be on the darker side, and this time I really wanted to bring uh, a lot of positivity and make them very uplifting. And I'm really happy with how the photographs turned out. Yeah, they're beautiful. And how are you feeling? And how does it feel for you to have a self-portrait and also it being displayed in New York City. Yeah, I tell you, I do not like getting my photograph taken. <laughs> and uh, I decided, well, you know what? Let me just go ahead and put the camera on me. So I set up the tripod and uh, and I took that photograph that you're seeing right now. And uh, you know, it's very, as you, as we all know, when you get your photo taken, it's very, um, it's very personal. personal yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I just tried to really capture who I am in that photograph. And I think I did a pretty good job. Bob, it's World <laughs> Art Day today. Very yes. appropriate day to have you here, right? And so, you know, I think when you had your heart attack, a lot of us were so stunned. We were used to seeing you on The Biggest Loser. You were the picture of health. So what was it that you learned after that experience? What do you want to tell people about, you know, genetics and also what you learned? Yeah, I think the main thing is people need to really know what their history is mm -hmm. from the inside out. You cannot judge a book by its cover. I mean, when I dropped dead in that gym in Chelsea um, four years ago, mm -hmm. I mean, I looked good. Mm -hmm. You did? Absolutely. <laughs> I looked good, but uh, I did not know what was going on with me. And I think that what's so interesting about Survivor's have heart is that it's a full circle right now and the fact that I shared my story with um, all of you and Savannah that one day and then now we're going to have this whole exhibit over at the uh, Flatiron Plaza and I'm really excited on October 22nd and 23rd with these other photographs you're going to see Tamika and Tasha but um, I have three other subjects to another woman and two men and I I've learned so much during this time and I really feel like the main thing that I've learned is that we have to appreciate every single day. Mm -hmm. We have to appreciate right here and right now because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Especially after what's happened over the past mm -hmm. few years. That's right. I want to just ask about you. Every time we see you, you have a new tattoo. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and so, did, and you got a special one also on your... Um, yeah, I did. I, um, I got a couple of... Uh, I get tattooed at Smith Street Tattoo Parlor in Brooklyn and uh, and I got like these, um, these hands on my chest, which was literally the most painful tattoo in the world thank you Eli um, for that but I also got a heart on my uh, on my leg commemorating that with a nurse because let me tell you mm -hmm. the nurses when I was going through my um, recovery they were there for me like you would not believe so I have nothing but mad respect for um, the nurses that helped me it's great to see you brother you know you look great by no, the way all, well, all three of you well, thank you very much oh, wow. you, my <laughs> old trainer Bob I was Bob going Bob. to say <laughs> he looks great because of you Bob, Bob Harper and I worked out a couple years ago we did shortly before the heart attack right before my heart attack I mean, I'm not going to say no correlation no I'm not no going to say there it is. that Craig there had anything is. to do with it oh look oh, there you are it's a heck of a workout my man 
<laughs> Look at you. That was the last time I've been in that gym with Bob, too. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, thank New York City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wound eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels. Rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels. And of course, you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. I about the salmon and cream cheese together. Like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hey, Hello. how are you? Welcome to the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you great guys. Great to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So this is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for you, because you usually would see so-and-so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he'd had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank <laughs> goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Hattie, Ida, and Ann. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. your boss. Yeah, and I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family, and that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Ann became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start and so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water or when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. 
Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah. First of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish. When we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon, but sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know that cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of... of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side. 
And she once said that before she knew the word feminist, when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression. You're here in the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that, you know, people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and lox and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> Okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get it that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> It takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right, so, so uh, I watch people slice and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices mm. are, don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick Slice. Are you making so, faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Al. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's drastically a very, more that's than a, you think. That's more than oh my gosh, that's a very thick slice. We call slice those of, chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. Uh, in Spanish. I was going to say, that sounded that, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. No. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture, which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into lox. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. Is your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year gonna look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. We began our cross America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin. Here in Nashville. From Washington, D.C., the site of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking smack part of this. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community?
for breaking news in our changing world. Download the NBC News app. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I'm here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there, and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly 8 million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells all right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food, food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Caslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out, he of, went, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step, cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. Uh -huh. It's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right. So what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, just do the bone. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Good. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Underneath. And we're gonna lay it onto this, the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're gonna grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally, we would probably dry, uh, wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish. But for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. OK. That's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours 
This process imparts a subtle smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the You oven? bet. All right. All right. Hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. Now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the U.S. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. week-long journey across America from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it is the Back on the Lower East Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Want to show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? They are. About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, it's a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know <laughs> why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. We're watching climate change happen right now, and 
I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and mox was gonna be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty lox. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. Uh, so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for. So we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there. Okay, so let's get started. I'm, I'm really it. fascinated. Okay, all right, I'm excited. So we have prepared, what do we have? Maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you. These are huge. These would have been huge carrots. Seriously, yeah, like wow. the size of my forearm. But you <laughs> you have you have sliced them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. So this this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm, interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling I'm, yeah. it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's gonna have to kill me. <laughs> so I'm just gonna start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great, so I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. It's another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot you of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba? Yeah. Are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you got to drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's, like, it's bean water. It's bean, bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pour, okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we tossed them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking just ah. to sound like classy. Okay. Like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Chai, Cheers. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. Okay, a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future! <laughs> A bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City.
Hello and thanks for joining us for Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. There's no better time to think about change than the beginning of a new year. So for the next 25 minutes, we are focusing on you, giving you a roadmap to getting your life where you want to be, from personal wishes to professional goals. And by the way, you're not alone when it comes to thinking about the year ahead. Here's what our Today family is focusing on. Professional goal would just to, to simply be to not get fired. Um, my personal goal uh, would be to maybe work a little less, spend a little bit more time with, with my children uh, because they're going up a little too fast. Well, if so, you get fired, you'll have more time. That's true. That's a good point. So maybe my professional goal should be to get fired. Don't edit this. Don't you edit this. Those are my goals. Okay, so I hope to spend more time, just uninterrupted time, playing with my kids. So phone away on the ground, rough housing, playing hide and seek, coloring, whatever it is, I wanna do that, which we do, but uninterrupted. Uninterrupted playtime with my kids. The habit that I want to break this new year is the phone addiction. And I had like this big epiphany last week. And I asked myself, are you happier with it or without it? And I realized I was happier without it. So it's time to put that baby away. One thing I want to work on in the upcoming year, I want to spend far less time on this wretched device. All right, personal or professional goal for 2022. The personal goal has to be, I, I've made these videos for my family before, like a collection of like the iPhone photos and videos, and my kids love it. It's been a year since I've done another one, so I'm gonna try to put them together and, and make a little film project for the family. I actually have a tiny real goal for the next year, and that is to finally, finally learn to cook something. <laughs> Why did you laugh? Do I have a, a personal goal for 2022? I guess I, I just want to just be a little more healthy. Uh, me and my wife did this Whole30 thing for 30 days, which is a great diet and cleanse, and it really changed our lives. We loved it, but we only did it for one month. So I think we're going to try to do it for, for more months in the years ahead. Professionally, uh, is it to be to be more loving and giving to my, my co-workers. I really hope we take Read with Jenna, which has been this really fun part of my job, the book club that we've made together and make it bigger. That's my goal. Words of inspiration for, for anybody uh, in 2022. I think, uh, you know, uh, love others as you would want to be loved. And, and I think we all might treat each other just a little bit better. Whatever the question is, love is the answer. Try to lean into love. Uh, I heard a great quote about faith this year, which has stayed with me, which is sometimes people need to see to believe, but if you believe, then you see. I just think that 2022 is going to be a good year. I'm going to knock on wood because we've said that about the last couple years, but I feel like this year we're going to get a break. Seek out love, block out the rest, and just keep the train going 2022. Just like our Today Show family, we all have goals and aspirations for the next year, but worry and anxiety could be holding you back. That's why we have some tips to cope so you can make 2022 your best year yet. Joining us now is psychiatrist Dr. Sue Varma. Welcome, Dr. Varma. So good to see you in person. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about this because I think for a lot of us, obviously, it's been a really tough two years for the world. Absolutely. And so as we look to the new year, we need an, a mental break. How do you even go about starting to give yourself that space? Great question, Vicki. And you know, in order to give ourselves space, there's two big things that we have to do. We have to manage our time and we have to manage our outlook. And when it comes to our time, the thing that I see is that a a lot of people give the best part of their day away to others, whether it be checking emails first thing in the morning or taking care of the household and getting the family ready. What we really need to do is carve out time for ourselves. If it's a 20 minute do not disturb sign you put on your computer, you wake up 20 minutes early to be able to spend time for yourself. You hire a babysitter so you can go to a walk for 20 minutes. 20 minutes is not a lot of time, okay. but what it says to yourself is that I'm making a commitment either to creativity, to my goals, to my productivity. It's about creating intention and purpose. Purpose. The other thing I say is manage your outlook, and this is yeah. so important. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we 
always have a tendency to do the three P's of pessimism just talked about in our field. Mm. Uh, personalization, um, thinking something is permanent, and thinking something that's bad is pervasive. Mm. And for example, if your boss doesn't respond to you, you say, oh my God, it's me. Right. You personalize it. You say that this, I'm going to lose my job. You weak catastrophize. Things will never get better. Mm -hmm. And the outlook, the, the answer to that is reframe. So say to yourself, what would you say to a friend? You would say to a friend, this is circumscribed. Your boss is probably dealing with a lot. It's right. not you. Yeah. So if you're able to say, what would you say to somebody else, or would this bother you five, five years from now, probably not, then let it go. We hear so much about how important meditation is, and I think it's something that we, they call it the practice for a reason, because you have to do it over and over to kind of get more accustomed to it. But you say there are also some alternatives. If meditation is too hard for you, what else can you do? Yes, so meditation helps us be mindful. It helps us be present. So I would say if, if meditation is too much, because a lot of people say it's too anxiety provoking, I'm left alone with my thoughts, I don't want that. Mm. I would say just be present. If you're talking to somebody, don't do anything else. Don't check yeah. your phone. Single-mindedness, single focus, so that that's very helpful. The other thing I would say is progressive muscle relaxation. Now, I don't know if you'd be up for trying this with me. By sure, yeah, okay. always. So basically, you're closing your eyes and you're okay. settling down in your chair. And the idea is that you're going to tense and relax muscle group by muscle group. Mm. So Vicky, just want you to settle in your chair, tense your fists really, really tight, 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 and then you let release. And I want you to tense again, tight, 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 and release. And then next you do your shoulders, you tense them really, really tight, bring them up to your ears and then you release. Bring your shoulders up to your ears, and then you release. Oh, and yeah, I can feel go. a difference in my body. Yes. No and, question about it. And the idea is that we live constantly in a state of tension where we're like this all the time. Right. And the idea is that you want to do this intentionally. We need to unclench. Yes. 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 To tense okay. and then release. And okay. you do this muscle group by muscle group. And this induces what we call the relaxation response. It induces the vagal nerve, the parasympathetic, the slow and calming hormone in our body. Yeah, because we know the body has such an effect on the mind. So if it's hard for you to quiet yourself and get those thoughts in order, try to do something physical that yes. can have an effect. Yes. I love that. So a lot of people, let's talk about work. People are anxious about going back to work. You know, how do you tackle that anxiety uh, about things that you can't control? Yes, and that's such a great point that you're bringing up, things that you cannot control. So I'm a big believer in productive worry versus unproductive worry. Mm -hmm. And the idea is if you can keep a worry journal, right? So the worry journal, the idea is I want you to spend 10 minutes a day worrying about everything you can possibly imagine. And what studies have shown is that 85% of the time, the things that we worry about never actually happen and the 15 percent of the time that they do we're better equipped to handle it than wow. we gave ourselves credit for so productive worry is what can you do make a list what do I need to do for my job is it my outfits that I need to try on the day before is it meal prep is it taking lunch with me is it masks and hand sanitizers mm -hmm. is it knowing the commuting the commuter schedule is it having child care so those are the things you have control over and that's very important for us to exercise control because we have lost a lot of that we've been stripped away of control of agency and we want to bring that back so so do what you can for the productive aspect and the unproductive, that's where the worry comes in. Just write everything down. Say that stat for me one more time. What was the percentage of things that actually occur that you worry about? 15% of the time. And what's the time that we spend worrying about this? 85% of the time. Wow. Okay. That's dramatic. Last question really quickly. Sleep. Obviously, we can all use more sleep. Quality sleep helps our immune system. It helps in so many ways. What tips do you have there for us to get a good night's rest? Yes. So good mental hygiene uh, and mental sleep and, and sleep begins in the morning. So I would say it's really important that in the morning get in 20 minutes of daytime sunlight shut the blue light shut the devices down an hour before bedtime and do a 60 second deep breathing exercise and don't forget the worry journal because a lot of times we have problems sleeping is because of all the things we're worrying about mm -hmm. during the day get that out of your mind cleanse purge in the worry diary i love it dr varma so many good tips in that chunk thank you so much great to see you thank you so much all right well if a focus on fitness nutrition and being all around healthier is your hope for 2022 we have the tools to support you on your personal journey Plus, if the road to a better you means minimizing a mess, yes, that's me. We have the tips to organize everything from your workspace to your closet. A lot more when Consumer Confidential returns. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. We began our Cross America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin, here in Nashville, from Washington, D.C., the side of our nation's capital you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? What are you 
doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin. Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just me too. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Our week-long journey across America from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. If a focus on living happier and healthier is your goal for the new year, health and fitness expert Stephanie Mansour is here to show you some simple things you can do without spending a fortune, and that's so important. Welcome, Stephanie. So good to see you in person. Thank you. All right, so when it comes to health and fitness, I know it can be really overwhelming for folks to just even start a routine. So what's your advice for just getting over that hump, taking that first step? Yes, so many of my clients that are focusing on weight loss and getting healthier are successful, and they're used to having big lofty goals and then achieving them. However, However, when it comes to our own health and wellness, Vicki, we really want to reduce those goals. So instead of having a goal to work out for 50 minutes a day, every single day this week, I actually want you to go on a three-day spree. Okay. So this three-day spree is just five minutes a day of movement. Mm -hmm. So whether that's a walk around the block, whether that's playing your favorite song in your house and dancing around yes. and playing it on repeat for five minutes, or you can even go into the kitchen and do 10 squats, 10 push-ups at the counter, 10 side ab exercises. You don't have to get down on the ground. Right. Or you can even do five minutes of stretching in bed in the morning before you get out. Just commit to be fit for five minutes a day, three days at a time. I love that. I think that is bite size. It's totally workable. And I think when you think the length of two songs is yeah. five minutes, you can do it if you pick two of your favorite songs. Yeah, exactly. You can do it anywhere. I like how you're like, you don't even have to get on the ground. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think this is one of the best trends to come out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. which is working out from home. People yes. have gotten used to it. They were forced to do it. And now they really love it. But even with that extra time that we have, since a lot of people aren't commuting anymore, mm -hmm. it still seems hard to like pack it in because you fill it with work or you fill it with other things. Right. So what do you say to carve out that time? Yeah, you know, people are cleaning their toilet bowls instead of working out. I mean, yeah. that's how much people are delaying exercise. So what we really want to do is get to the root of this. Mm -hmm. So what is your big reason why? Why do you want to work out? Why do you want to commit to being fit? Why do you deserve to feel better in your body and to feel more empowered about making healthier choices for yourselves? Mm -hmm. So really get to the nitty gritty of what's your big reason why, mm -hmm. and then start to look at your day and see how you can fit in exercise. So everyone's brushing their teeth in the morning and at night. Let's do some squats. Let's mm -hmm. do some leg lifts. Let's do some calf raises. Or if you're sitting at your desk at work, let's do some shoulder rolls. Oh Here gosh, we can, yeah. yeah, loosen up the traps, the neck tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doesn't that feel good? Yeah, it feels great. <laughs> I know, you can also drop one ear to the opposite shoulder, feel a stretch here for yes. a few breaths. You can do that while you're doing emails, yeah. while you're on work calls. Oh my gosh, definitely. You can even turn your camera off on Zoom and do this mm -hmm. while you're on video calls. But really just fitting in these little movements throughout the day right. is gonna retrain your brain to fit this in. And you said five minutes for three days a week. It's so doable. What yes. about when you hit a roadblock, right? You, yes. you get started, but then it's the holidays and you feel bad because you've eaten horribly for four 
four days straight yes. or, or longer. <laughs> what do you do to get back on track? I always encourage my clients to use my 50% rule. Okay. So if your goal was 10,000 steps a day, cut that in half. 50%, your goal is now 5,000 steps a day. Really use this even if you're focusing on healthy eating. If you mm -hmm. want to fit in five fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. a day, cut that in half. Only okay. focus on two to three. Okay. So take this 50% rule and apply it whenever you're in a stressful situation of your life or whenever it's the holidays. Use that 50% rule to let yourself off the hook. Got it. But still, success breeds success. So when you hit that goal, you're going to be more motivated tomorrow to repeat and do it again. So 50% to, to try to help you build back that momentum. Exactly. I like that. That's good. Giving yourself that break. Yes. What about food? So we have yeah. a couple of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches yes. that you yes. bought. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh. Well, the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you know, like there's two options, right? Like we have the normal peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but then we also have one that looks exactly identical. And I snuck flax seeds into that. Oh. So that's a healthy fat. So you want to think of ways that you can add in nutrients. Now, when we're talking about smoothies, mm -hmm. you have two smoothies right. that probably look identical. At least they do when I make them. But when I make one of them, I add in spinach. I love so it. a handful of spinach, it's, it's going to help you and with you don't weight loss. It. You don't taste it. You hardly see it. So I really preach, you know, add in. Don't right. take out. I it's unrealistic that. to cut out sugar completely or for a lot of people to cut out alcohol completely. Mm -hmm. So think about ways that you can add in nutrients. Food is fuel. Right. So that's how we want to look at it rather than the, all the list of things we need to deprive ourselves of. What snacks are always on your go-to list? Yes. So an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but only if you add protein to yeah. it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so an apple is an insufficient snack because it's sugar and carbs, which are healthy but it's going to cause your blood sugar levels to spike mm. up and then you're going to drop and crave more and mm -hmm. spike up. So if you're an emotional eater or if you're someone that overeats at holiday meals, mm -hmm. you want to add protein. So okay. an apple with almond butter or with a handful of nuts, carrots with hummus uh -huh. or Greek yogurt. And my personal favorite to grab when I'm on the go yeah. is a hard boiled egg and a handful of raspberries. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I protein that, but yeah. with a fruit or a vegetable. And raspberries are really high in fiber. Yes. I like to I, add in because yes. nobody likes to take away. I know. You just keep adding the vegetables. It helps you feel fuller, too. Exactly. And it's good for you with all the vitamins and stuff. Yes. All right, so let's talk about apps because a lot of people want apps to support them, you know, in their fitness journey. Yes. One of my friends talked about this one where it, it doesn't tell you a number for how you weigh. It just gives you colors. So yeah. you're like, if you're in the green zone, you're feeling good or, you know, the black zone. I don't know exactly. But I yeah. thought that was really interesting because it makes you not focused on a metric, but right. it just gives you zones. Yes. So what apps do you recommend? Exactly. I love that, Vicki. And, you know, I've actually been inspired to create an app myself yeah. because so many people are asking for apps. Mm -hmm. And I love apps when you focus on, on what it is that you're trying to get from the app. So if you are someone who's into those metrics and those numbers and you're focusing on food, get an app that focuses on, you know, calories or macros mm -hmm. or where you can scan the bar label. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone that's focused on workouts, then you want to find an app that's heavily focused on exercising. Okay. And finally, if mindset is your issue, if you know what to do, but you're just not doing it, you want to find an all-inclusive app that's going to help send you those reminders or maybe, you know, do the zones like you mentioned and colors. So really, you know, make you relaxed about your health and fitness rather than feeling like you have to do every single thing right. Right. And I also want to encourage people, you know, free trials are mm -hmm. key. Yes. So, so test try it things out. out. Yes. And pricing does not necessarily dictate quality. So I love apps that are in the $9.99 to $14.99 range. Okay. Don't feel like you need a to year? commit. Uh, a a month, month. A month. Okay. Yeah. Don't feel like you need to commit Got to it. a larger number just okay. for it to be a better app. And what's the name of your app? Step It Up with Steph. All right. And Thank I'm you. Steph, as yeah, you know. That's right. <laughs> Stephanie Mansour here with us in the flesh. Thank you so much. Great Thank to see you. Thank you, Vicki. All right. Well, from health and fitness goals to professional aspirations. Whether you're looking for a new job, that big promotion, or an entire career change, figuring out the best moves to land your next big gig can really be a maze. Luckily, Katherine Patterson, career coach and TikTok influencer with over 20 years of engineering and recruiting experience, she's here to share her insight and help you reach your professional goals in 2022. Katherine, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, Catherine, the pandemic, it certainly has a lot of people rethinking their jobs. Some people thinking it might be time for a career change. So what's the first step? How do you start navigating that job search? After the pandemic, everyone was just so rearing to just get into um, a new career. And I'll tell you what, right now is the best time. The job market has never been better. We're at four point, a little over 4% unemployment rate. Most people, they're gonna look for their job title, right? For example, let's say software engineer or office manager. 
I don't necessarily would do, I wouldn't do that. Mm. I would search for your skills. Look for the skills because I'll tell you what, you might be surprised at what comes about. So Catherine, That's start that search, not with the job title necessarily, but with the skills yeah. or things that you have that you want to use in that next job. That's great advice. Absolutely. What about social media? What are some ways that you can use social media in your job search? So with social media, we should break down those two words, right? Social and media. Social people and then media images, right? It goes beyond your resume. Your resume is just gonna be a document, just text. So with social media, what you can do, like your LinkedIn profile, you can take advantage of the, all that space. People forget that your LinkedIn profile is searchable. Mm -hmm. So utilize all of that opportunity like an ad, like a commercial. You can use keyword optimization. Those uh, recruiters out there, they have automated alerts. So when you update your LinkedIn page, for example, they will get alerts mm. that trigger them to go find you. Oh, that's good to know. I didn't know that. Yeah. When it comes oh, yeah. to the actual resume and you mentioned updating your resume, doing those things to trigger alerts, but talk about the format. How should you format that resume? And also what are some red flags, things you should not have on your resume? Oh boy. Oh gosh. Okay. So a lot of these companies out there, especially the Fortune 500s, they have very sophisticated systems because there's uh, only a few of those recruiters and millions of you guys, right, of the job seekers of us. Um, so definitely no pictures. And I don't know if any, any one of us are doing that anymore. They, they're not machine readable. Mm. So definitely keep it boring. Keep it simple and, you know, straightforward. Another thing is dollars and numbers. When I see dollars and numbers on a resume, like how much money you made or saved for your last employer, that's that just sings to me, right? It goes mm -hmm. to the top of my pile. Okay. They love it, okay? That's really important. So those two things are powerful on a resume. Great hacks. Thank you, Catherine Patterson. No, really enough. appreciate your time. Sure, thank you. All right, cut the clutter, the phrase to help you minimize the mess from your desk to your closet when Consumer Confidential returns. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Ooh, the answer's Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> Some late breaking news for hours in the Iowa caucuses. Private man delivered it. All right, it just did too. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Ooh, the answer's Today Show's newest fan. This is the Little Al Roker. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
last year and a half, we have probably spent more time at home than ever. And it's very easy for our spaces to go from clean to cluttered in a flash, especially if you're working from home. But there are some simple things you can do to help minimize the mess. And here with me is lifestyle expert Maureen Petrosky, and she's going to help us stay organized all year long, which I all love for long. 2022. That's one of my goals. So let's talk first about our virtual desktops, right? Exactly. For a lot of us, we're on our screens all day. So what can we do there to make it seem kind of less cluttered visually with on our virtual desktop. The desktops. very first thing that most people do is pick up their phone in the morning. Yeah. So if you pick up your phone and your phone is cluttered, you're already starting with a mind full of mess. Ah. So what we want to do is folders are your friends. On your phones, use your folders. If you can't see those apps, you're not going to use those apps. So put them into folders where you know where they're going to be. And then in your email, when it comes to email, we all have tons of email. The rule of thumb with email is just like clothes. If you haven't worn it in a year, get rid of it. So you can reorganize your email by oldest to newest okay. and just click, 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 click. To delete, delete all them. the old ones? I know it sounds scary, but I promise you it feels so good. Okay, I love it. I'm not one of those like get it down to zero people. I know there are people who don't want to see any like new, I can't do that yet. I understand yet, that. It doesn't have to hard. be zero. Okay. But it shouldn't be older, older than, than a year. year. Okay, I like that. That's an easy rule. All right, we right, let's talk about physical desks. Yes. That's an area of actual physical visual clutter for a lot of folks. Right. How do you organize your workspaces in real life? We have a cute little pile here, but normally on people's desks, there's lots of piles. <laughs> yes. So this is a spot where you might want to invest in something and get a cute little desktop organizer okay. like we have here. So again, you can actually see the items that you need to get through yeah. on your desk. Piles are bad. And again, piles are bad, but drawers that are full of stuff is just mm -hmm. as bad. So if you can't see your items, like here, this is just a cute little organizer. Both of these things under $20. Yeah. Small investment will last you the whole year long. I do like that because you can put your mail in one thing, a bills, and then like junk mail in another. In look going, at it. outgoing. It's a yeah. little bit of organization that will sustain you the whole year long. Anything to get rid of the piles. I love that. Okay, what about um, things that you, you like to say, if you can't see it, you don't need it. So you That's talked right. about email, you talked about physical mail. Closets is another spot, a trouble spot for some of us, especially with clothes being, you know, messy everywhere. So what is your right. tip when and it comes you, to organizing those spaces? If you can't see it, you won't wear it either. Right, that's so true. How many times, Vicki, have you gotten ready to go out and before you're out the door, most of your closet is on the floor? Yeah, it happens. Or on your bed or somewhere mm -hmm. cluttering your, your bedroom? Well, I've got two really great tips for that. First is a dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. If you know you've got a big event coming up, you're going out Friday night or maybe a job interview, try on your outfit before, well before you're actually gonna need it. That's gonna save you from ripping through and tearing through. Got it, to make sure it fits, it looks the make way sure you want. Make sure it fits, that's yeah, okay. so important to make sure it fits. Make sure it's appropriate for the weather. Yes. You might think you're gonna wear something and the weather might change. Check the weather on your phone, now you've got that's it so in true. A, an app that you can see, yeah. and then you're gonna know that it fits you and it's gonna save a lot of stress. Okay. The next thing is to color code your closet. You'll see here we've got our closet rack. Love this. But when you have your blues, your reds, your black, white mm -hmm. all together, you know if you're looking for that red dress, it's going to be right where it's supposed to be. You know <laughs> what? Enlist your kids to help you too because they love doing this. My daughters love to put all my stuff in color-coded order and then it takes like some of the stress off and of you. And this is worth the time to do it, it is. because it, really it saves is. you stress, it saves you time then getting dressed and it minimizes the mess then for the rest of the year. And it's visually so pleasing. It's so nice. You'll see even here I just got the same color hangers. Yeah. So if you, that's another small investment okay. at any home store get rid of all those mismatched messy hangers you get all the same hangers put all your clothes in color coordination the french have a saying it's called mise en place uh -huh. it's everything in its place and a place for everything and that's what we've that. done here they talk about that with cooking but it works in exactly. other areas to organize it your is life. from cooking you're right okay the hardest part i think for a lot of us to organize it, it, mementos things that yes. you've collected over time things that have han been handed down to you from your family what do you do about that? Because I feel like the first thing a lot of organizers tell us is purge, but it's hard to get rid of it sentimental hard to get things. Rid of things. So in the kitchen is a spot where we end up with lots of multiples of things. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we'll talk about the next generation. I've got tons of whisk, tons of spatulas, strange items that you might not use anymore, mismatched glassware. This is the perfect time to put together that gift package for mm -hmm. maybe someone in your family or someone you know who just got their first apartment oh, like or a, a new grad that's yes. looking to go out on their own. Share the items. So keep yeah. them in the family, but share them. And then those sentimental items like you mentioned, like a cake dish or a candy mm -hmm. dish or a serving dish that you know you are not going to use. If you are not the entertainer, if you just keep moving these things around <laughs> or putting things in around them, shoving it's them back time to, the to give them a new life. Mm. Give them to someone who will love them give them a new life and minimize the mess in your life. Whoever gave it to you will be happy to know that. That's true. And I like how you collected them all because when you put 
them all together, you realize I don't need seven <laughs> spatulas you or do not six need cutting seven boards spatulas. or whatever, exactly. right? Okay, these are fantastic tips. Thank you, Maureen. Always good to see you. So nice to see you too. All right, well, that is all the time we have today. I'm Vicki Wynn. Thanks for hanging out with me on Consumer Confidential. We'll see you next time. Okay, um, so Oprah, I think that if you, if I stopped 15 people on the street and asked them like, who's got it all figured out, uh, who understands life, I think, they, I think your name would be top of the list because not only uh -huh. have you kind of talked about stuff you've been through, but you've also healed people, helped people heal. So, you know, they say hurt people, hurt people, and healed people, healed people. I couldn't help but thinking as you're doing this kind of deep dive into mental health and into trauma, did you find as you were digging through all this that there were actually there was actually some grief inside you that had yet to be resolved, had yet to be healed? I didn't find that, but you're just asking the question makes me emotional because what I did find through the process of working on the Me You Can't See for Apple TV Plus and also working on the What Happened to You book with Dr. Perry, I yeah, there's there's a beautiful uh book, a poem called Yet Do I Marvel by County Cullen. Hmm. And yet do I marvel at my life. I don't know how <laughs> I did it. I mean, one of the conversations I had with Dr. Bruce Perry when uh, we first decided to do this book, I asked him, tell me, then why aren't I crazy? And he pointed out that you had relationships in your life other than your family members that made you feel valued, that allowed you to be seen and whole. And that is why to this day, I have deep appreciation and adoration, not just for my teachers, but all teachers who are doing that. Because I know that lots of kids go home to a life that isn't so good, but they can come and sit in a classroom mm. and be seen and be valued. Mm -hmm. And one of the great lessons for me, Hoda, as I know you're experiencing in your daily work, is that in, in listening to other people's stories, is that everybody <laughs> wants to be seen and they want to be heard and they want to know that their story matters. And so all of our relationships are about that. So one of the reasons I do consider myself uh, wise at this point in my life is because I've not only paid attention to my life, been observant of what's happened to me, but I've been a student of other people's lives and paid attention to what has happened to them. And we are just all on this spectrum. And that's one of the things I wanted to share in the What Happened to You mm. book. And one of the things I wanted to share in the series, uh, The Me You Can't See, is that we're all on the spectrum. And in the United States, Hoda, in the United mm -hmm. States, one out of five people admit that they are going through some mental health struggle. Mm. So we're all on the spectrum. Some days you're 10 plus, yeah. you know? Most days I'm like traveling in the 11, 12 range and, and on a scale of one to 10. Mm -hmm. And some days you're four or minus four, depending on what's going on in your life or what has happened to you or how you were able mm -hmm. to process it. So that's what I wanted people to understand for both the book and the series. Well, the book and the series are both so enlightening. And I was listening to one of your, your master class the other day, which I, I adored, but you said something in there that struck me. You said, I never had therapy my show was my therapy. And I wondered mm -hmm. since that point, have you had therapy? Do you feel like you ever wanted or needed it? No. You know who is my therapist? Gail King. Mm -hmm. Because I, we talk in the book, uh, What Happened to You, about how we process our feelings. And when something terrible has happened to somebody, and I remember this with Elizabeth Smart, I talk about in the book, when I went to interview her parents and they were saying she hadn't told us what happened yet. I was like, why not? Why mm -hmm. haven't you heard? Why haven't you asked her? It's because when terrible things happen, even in our own lives that are not tragic things, but just like a, something with a boss or a, 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 a bad experience, it's you do it in doses with your with your girlfriends, with your husband, mm -hmm. with your partners and your relationships. You tell a little bit, then you laugh about something else. Then you go back and you tell a little bit more about it. Then you talk about it a little more. Then you process mm -hmm. it. So I've already always been able to dose 
uh, with Gail. Mm -hmm. And I would say in the 25 years of the show, she watched every show and every night I would have my conversation mm -hmm. that I now know the scientific term for it is I would do my dosing <laughs> with, with, with Gail about it. So I've always had um, the ability to be vulnerable, to share my truest feelings with Gail, with, 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 with my best friend, Bob Green, with Maria, mm -hmm. with, you know, people, uh, Stedman, who, who actually were always willing to tell me the truth. Right. So no, I've never had, I've never had a clinical therapist. I've never gone to a therapist. I've never laid on anybody's couch. I don't know if that's even real. Do you lay on the couch? <laughs> <laughs> but I have heard stories and shared stories and done exactly what we're trying to do with the me you can't see. I've seen myself and other people's stories. You know, mm -hmm. the first time I was able to admit that I had been sexually abused, raped, assaulted mm -hmm. as a nine-year-old happened on television. Mm -hmm. And it happened on television because a woman was sharing her story. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I swear until that moment, I was the only person who'd ever had that mm. happen to me. So in the middle of her, in a show, sharing her story, I went, that happened to me. Mm. And so that's that's how I got my therapy because I've had every major dysfunction <laughs> uh, discussed uh, on the air over the years and would see myself in other people's stories. And just as we've been able to do, I think, with the the series, The Me You Can't See, and use celebrities on purpose. Mm -hmm. Harry's story, my story, Glenn Close's story, Gaga's story, Damar's story, all there to show you that it doesn't matter where you come from, what mm -hmm. your background is, how much money you have, that we're all in the spectrum with everybody else. Mm -hmm. That's why there are stories from people's names you know and people's names you don't know, but that are equally relatable. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Oprah, what did you learn about your childhood brain? What, what did you learn recently through this book about how your childhood brain was processing all of that terrible stuff that you had to go through as a child? Mm, such a good question. Um, this book, the What Happened to You book in particular made me think really differently about my own life. So I think that certainly all of the feelings of um, not fitting in or, or my disease to please or okay. feeling like if I don't do what everybody wants me to do, I'm going to be rejected somehow up until my 40s, literally, when I was running the Oprah show and in the power seat, I would have such angst about having to let somebody go who deserved to be let go or having to be in a meeting with somebody who I was, I was going to have to disagree with them. Mm. And what I realized uh, after doing this book with Dr. Perry is that, oh, what I, what I was afraid of in every instance, I'm afraid I'm going to get a whipping. 
I'm afraid mm. I'm going to get that whipping, even though I'm the boss lady, mm. even though I'm the one in charge, even though I'm the one who's running the business. I still have that part of myself that until, you know, my late 40s, almost into my 50s, I was still trying to process and figure that part of myself out. I mean, I knew that the reason I felt that way was because of what had happened to me. Mm -hmm. I just hadn't processed it. So I would say that the What Happened to You book really mm -hmm. helped me think about my life. And also to understand that there must have been a lot of, I, I mostly remember the bad stuff, mm -hmm. but there had to be a lot of good stuff for me to have turned out the way that I did, you know? And I think so much of my sense of validation came from outside, like in the church. I was mm -hmm. speaking by the time I was three or four. And so I felt seen there. Mm -hmm. I felt seen by my, you know, t teachers. And, uh, you know, my grandmother, who was very harsh, but a lot like a lot of Black parents during that era, mm -hmm. um, the, the idea of hugging and loving on your child or even allowing the child to feel seen was just not a part of her part of her life. But she did give me Jesus. She did give me a belief in something bigger than myself. So I'm grateful for, for that. I love how you said up till you were about 10, you thought Jesus was your daddy. I thought that, I was, did. that was the best. You know what struck me? There were so many parts of this that struck me. Um, when you went to go see your mom in Milwaukee for the very first time at age six, mm -hmm. and you were told that you could not come in the house to sleep because you were too dark, your skin was too dark, you slept outside. Yeah. It struck me that you talked about a guardian angel, like you dreamt of an angel watching you. Did you, yeah. did you believe- I named being, her Melinda. Melinda? Yeah, I named her Melinda, yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you believe it was a real, I mean, to this day, do you think that there was really a guardian angel watching over you? I absolutely do. I believe that my belief that there was is what saved my mind. I believe that if I had not believed that I had something bigger and greater than myself to protect me, then I would have lost my mind. I would have become bitter. I would have been really very angry with my mother and I would have carried that bitterness in a way that would have affected my behavior in school. I would have been acting out. I would have, I would have been a different kind of person had I not had a belief in something that was bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. So do I believe the angel was there? I imagined that she was there. I literally would like see her on patrol, oh. you know, in my own little six year old mind, I would see her on patrol like she's there and she's taking care of me and I'm gonna be okay so that I could s sleep at night. And I, I think now knowing what I know about what happened to you, had I just slept there every night in the fear mm that I felt the very first night I arrived there, I wouldn't have survived it. Hmm. I wouldn't have survived it. And I would have awakened every day just angry. And But 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 I didn't. I awakened hmm. with, okay, and then we'd get on my knees and pray at night. She's going to come back again and she's going to protect me. So, yeah, I think the belief that she was real saved my mind. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news for our horses in the Iowa caucuses by the man with the 
right, it just fit that. too. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year gonna look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. How did you square the fact that you loved God so deeply and dearly, yet somehow these things kept, bad things were just happening to you? How did you square oh. those two? Oh, 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 I love this question, Hoda. There is a wonderful um, hymn that says, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now, for my journey now, for my journey now. Maya Angelou actually wrote a book called Wouldn't Take Nothing for My Journey Now. And I wouldn't take anything mm. for having been raised the way that I was mm. and having the experiences that I did because every one of them created what um, Bruce Perry calls in, in What Happened to You, post-traumatic wisdom. Mm -hmm. It is because I was sexually abused, raped at nine and 10, 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 that I have such empathy for people who've experienced that. It is mm -hmm. because I was raised poor and no running water and going to the well and getting whippings that I have such compassion for people who mm -hmm. have experienced it. And so it has given me a broader understanding and a deeper appreciation for every mm -hmm. little and big thing that I, I now have. And now this is what I now, I just had this thought. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for bringing it up. I had this thought after uh, writing What Happened to You, I suddenly realized that being sent to live with my mother, which at the time felt like my grandmother is now abandoning me and sending me away. Oh my God, Hoda, I realized that was my saving grace hmm. because otherwise I would have started school in Mississippi, mm. segregated Mississippi, mm sitting in a classroom where I was, would be made to feel that I was less than the other uh. children. Instead, I got shipped to Milwaukee and put in that kindergarten class where I already knew how to read because my grandmother gave me Jesus. I knew all the Bible stories and knew all the... So when I walked into kindergarten, I write my kindergarten teacher a letter and say, Miss New, I do not belong here because I know a lot of big <laughs> words. And I, and I write them out. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Joshua. And I got sent to the principal's <gasps> office. So it wasn't until, and the move to the mm. first grade the mm -hmm. next day. So I got myself out of kindergarten. But it wasn't until doing the big revelation for me is, oh, mm. even my grandmother mm. becoming ill and not being able to take care of me in a particular moment mm. is the thing that changed the trajectory of my life in that moment. I, that, I, I just thought, wow, I had never thought of that before. Like, whoa, what happened to me? Oh, I got sent away. I was no longer with my grandmother. And uh, oh, that is the thing that saved me. Because I would be a very different person had I been raised in a, in a, in a Mississippi uh, school. Oh my God, I want to weep right now. I have, I'm having this big wave that's, that's hit me. It's <laughs> crashing on me. Oh, that's beautiful. No, but that, 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 that's, that's what, that's yeah. what post-traumatic wisdom is. Yeah. It's like, oh, that thing happened. I thought it yeah. was a terrible thing. Yeah. I'm sleeping out on the porch. I'm, uh, I felt separated, not a part of. That created a sense of, oh, I got to take care of myself. Wow. It's, it's me and the, my, my angel team wow. here. You know, so all of it, all of it works out if you're open to see it. Right. If you're open to see what happened to you and let what happened to you allow you to recognize mm -hmm. the me you can't see because they're all connected. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it what's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. The 
Meet the Press Chuck Todd Cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Let's talk for a second about uh, Prince Harry. He spoke out. And, you know, for people to get rid of that stigma of mental health, people have to speak out. And Prince Harry has been speaking out. And with his speaking out, Oprah, he's got gotten some criticism. I don't know whether it's for speaking out too much. He asked for privacy, and now people feel like they're seeing him everywhere. What are the critics not understanding about what's going on? Uh, I think privacy, uh, you know, I ask for privacy, and I'm talking all the time. So I think being able to have a life that you are not intruded upon by photographers or people flying overhead or invading your life um, is what every person wants and deserves is to not to be intruded and invaded upon. And I think when they say they wanted privacy, that is what they were asking for. But the uh, one of the reasons um, from the very beginning when I had one of my early, early conversations with Harry about what do you think are the two most important issues facing the world now? And he said, climate change and mental health. And I said to him, oh, well, I'm doing the series on Apple for Apple TV Plus and, mm -hmm. and started talking about it. And then he said, well, when I turned to leave, Oda, he said, well, if you ever need any help with that, let me know. And I went, mm -hmm. did you say, <laughs> did I need some help? And so his interest uh, and partnership was really authentic and about his desire to champion these conversations. Mm -hmm. And so I think that your, your asking for privacy in your own personal life does not mean that you don't want to also use your platform to help the world see itself differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is also one of the reasons, Hoda, that Harry and I wanted to include Harry and I and the whole radical team, all of us working on this, wanted to, to, to include uh, people who were known mm -hmm. and people who were not known. Because, you know, what I think celebrity is good for, what you're being known is good for, is for people to be able to see themselves in you. Mm. I mean, that's what it is. It is being able to say, oh, if that is possible. And the same thing is true uh, whether you are being celebrated for something mm -hmm. that's accomplished or being acknowledged for being open and vulnerable uh, about something that is meaningful to you. Ah, oh, mm -hmm. that happened to mm -hmm, me too. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that's what people will come away from. Sure. And I'm hoping that people, you know, understand that for them, privacy means not being invaded, not being, not being intruded, but they are public figures who are going mm -hmm. to use their platform to speak to the world. And, and I'm sure you, we will continue to hear from them. Yeah. They didn't mean we're gonna go, privacy doesn't mean silence. Mm -hmm. That's what people are missing. Privacy doesn't mean silence. When they did their interview with you, Oprah, and you've, I'm sure, spoken to them since, obviously, did they, how, reflecting on it, did they have any regrets about sitting down and talking about their lives? Um, they have not shared any regrets with me. We had a conversation prior to the interview where I do this with every single person I ever speak to uh, about something important. Um, and I started doing it on my show mm -hmm. like around 1989, I think, um, going into the green room and saying to the person, tell me what you want. Mm -hmm. What do you want to happen here? What do you mm -hmm. want to come out of this interview? And uh, we didn't meet before, but we texted and both of them shared that they wanted the truth mm. and they wanted truth and they wanted healing and they wanted this to be, um, in, you know, an open conversation and that there was nothing off limits. And I, this is my number one goal mm. was I understood what had happened to them 
And I wanted the rest of the world to come away being able to answer the question, oh, now mm -hmm. I understand what happened. Mm -hmm. So the question was, why did they leave? That was the, that was mm -hmm. the number one question mm -hmm. that I wanted to have answered. And I think by the time that interview was done, people understood. Oprah, did you think that Harry was, was caught off guard by anything that Meghan said during the interview? Was he surprised by anything? Mm. Let me just tell you, that couple is one of the most in sync couples I've mm -hmm. ever seen. I mean, it is a joy to see them uh, together behind the scenes. And so I think that they probably, that they have not shared this with me, but I, I, I think that they would have not just shared their intention with me, but they would have had a conversation um, about what they both wanted to accomplish mm -hmm. in, in, in that interview, so. Well, Oprah, this was great. I love you. Uh, I wish we had more time, but I always want more time with you. And um, Wonderful talking to you. Thank Wonderful you so much. You. Thank you for everything. Today is good as hell. <laughs> we have been waiting for this day. We have renamed this day. Yeah. Oprah Day. Yes. You want to know that? She's been very busy on her tour. Let's check out what she's been up to. Uh, I can't take it. <laughs> I have some good news to share. I'm going on tour. Oprah Winfrey is hitting the road. She's four stops into her nine city tour across America. As part of Oprah's 2020 vision tour, your life in focus. Oprah covers diet, fitness, mental health, and more during each day-long event, which are run by WW, the company formerly known as Weight Watchers. Oprah is part owner of WW and sits on their board. As long as there is breath, there is more. I see you back there! Throughout her tour, Oprah's been joined on stage by A-listers, including Lady Gaga, The Rock, Tina Fey, and Amy Schumer. Her next stop, Brooklyn alongside Michelle Obama. But first, she's with us, right here in Studio 6A. Everyone, say hello to Oprah. Oprah! <laughs> Need a moment. Just uh, to, do y'all feel like you need a moment? <laughs> I feel like I need a moment. This is um, so fun, guys. Okay. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> and you manifested she did, this, didn't she, yes, Oprah? She did. I tried to manifest it, but really all I wanted was this moment. Oh. Thank you. I wanted this oh. moment. Oh. Let's do it again. Oh. Oh. I wanted oh. I manifested oh. this oh. moment. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Which means, I mean, I can't tell you, Oprah, I feel like I've been in this business a hundred years. <laughs> and I was, thank you. Oh, yes. Oh, that's so cool. Isn't that cool? You probably don't need one, but. Oh, good, I'm good, I'm good. We do. I'm good. I'm good. Anyway. Uh, um, I, sorry, goodbye. Um, I can't, cool. you know, I think, you know when people say like you mean so much to me, but they've never met you and I know maybe it always does seem a little weird, but this is really one of those moments for me. So well, thank, 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 you. You. thank you. Thank you for coming. So, 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 yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah. tell me why, I know I've heard you say that, but tell me why, like you watched over the years. Yes. You, Yes. I watched you over the years. I've watched you lift people up. Yeah. Every, you know, there are like, there's only a couple people on the earth who you want to emulate in our business. 
and I, used, I watched you like hold people's hearts in your hand. Oh. And I remember thinking like, how does she do that? And, and you did it in such a way and it was always so tender and real. And like the fact that you're sitting here on this day is really kind of blowing my mind. <laughs> I mean, I'm 55 or 56, nobody knows. <laughs> But it doesn't matter. It, it it just shows you like the the kid in you is still in there when you walk in the door. So well, thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. everybody in here must yes. feel the same way. We've got a fantastic Wednesday edition of Pop Start Plus for you. Thanks for being here. On the show today, some real class acts, Fran Drescher and Lindsey Vaughn. Plus, we dug up some Seinfeld gems right out of our vault. But first, let's check out today's Pop Start News. We're going to start with this year's big news on the Academy Awards on Tuesday. The president of ABC Entertainment announcing that this year's Oscars will actually be returning with a host. Oh, makes sense. The first time in three years that Hollywood's biggest night is going to include a master of ceremonies. You might recall Jimmy Kimmel was the last man to hold that position back in 2018. And although there's no word yet on who's going to get the gig, Judd Apatow, of all people, throwing out some suggestions online, writing on Twitter, I would like to suggest Steve Martin and Martin Short host. It would be pure joy and we need Need that. Well, couldn't go wrong with that. No, well. absolutely. Steve's hosted the Oscars for uh, a few times over the years, and he's, well, he's never been afraid to poke fun at the whole thing. The proceeds from tonight's Oscar telecast, and I think this is so great, will be divvied up among huge corporations. <laughs> so simple, so funny. Yes. Everything's funny right yeah. now. The way yeah. the world is spinning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Whoever hosts that show is going to crush. It's going to be good. Yeah. Uh, the Academy Awards set for March 27th. Next up, Reese Witherspoon yeah, and Ina Garten. The, the barefoot Contessa is keeping it real in the comment section of Witherspoon's latest post on Instagram. On Monday, the actress shared four healthy habits that she's working on. Here they are. They include drinking a big, giant glass of water in the morning, trying to get outside, oh. read more, maybe 90 minutes a day, get to bed earlier before 10, don't indulge mm -hmm. in any of that late night TV binging. Mm -hmm. Well, as great as all of that sounds, Ina thought that maybe those weren't so realistic. So she responded with her own list of perhaps easier habits. <laughs> One, drink a large, uh, more large Cosmos. Two, stay up late watching addictive streaming services series. Three, stay in bed in the morning playing Sudoku instead of reading a good book. And finally, four, spend more time safely with the people that I you love. I love it. That's Not why so we love Ina. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so did everybody online. The comment section blew up with support for Ina. Uh, users on Instagram leaning a little bit more towards the beloved TV <laughs> chef's recipe for happiness. But Reese. Team Ina. Team Ina. Yeah. Yeah. All right on. now. Yeah. Next up, Foo Fighters. The band's heading to the big screen. There's a new horror comedy out with the band. On Tuesday, the first trailer dropped for Foo's upcoming flick. It's called Studio 666. And in the movie, they really go for it here. The band heads to a creepy mansion in Encino, California to work on their next album when things start taking a bit of a supernatural turn. The sound of this house is the sound of album 10. How are you feeling? Everything okay? Ever since we moved into this house, my mind is flooded. We all have writer's block. This is not just a creepy rock and roll house. It allows spiritual entities to cross into our world. It looks crazy. It looks funny. It's nuts. It's wild. There's a funny scene where Dave's working on a new song. He's pitching to the band. He yeah. starts at the beginning of Everlong, one of their famous songs. Yeah. And the, the band's like, uh, Dave, that's Everlong. We you, we made that 20 years ago. <laughs> He's like, oh, what's wrong with me? <laughs> uh, the movie also stars, as you might have seen there, Whitney Cummings, Will Forte, and Lionel Richie. Yeah. Studio 666 hits theaters on February 25th. And quickly and finally, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. After the stars and filmmakers of Being the Ricardos just took three of the biggest awards at last Sunday's Golden Globes, the iconic Hollywood couple now at the center of a new project heading to streaming. Prime Video is going to be debuting a new documentary in March. It's called Lucy and Desi. It's going to examine the careers and relationship more in depth of Ball and Arnez. That film is being directed by none other than today's queen of oh, comedy wow. herself, our friend Amy Poehler. Ooh. And the doc's going to feature an all-star lineup of the world of comedy. We've got Bette Midler, Carol Burnett, Charo. Norman Lear, just to name a few. Lucy and Desi will start streaming on March 4th. 
And we've got a few more noteworthy items here because it is Pop Star Plus after all. So first up, Bo and Yang, the SNL star, stopped by the Kelly Clarkson show on Tuesday and shared a funny moment that he felt like he was officially a true New Yorker after making the big move to the East Coast. So when you moved here, like, when did you finally feel like I am now a New Yorker? I was um, eating dim sum, and then I went to Columbus Park in Chinatown, and there was a, a pigeon lady, very home alone, too. I saw a rat scurry over her foot, and then she freaked out and screamed, and I thought, wow, this is the most New York thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and it's funny that, like, you're chill with pigeons, but not chill with rats, because I feel like that's a package deal. <laughs> I feel like it's a flying rat. God made them on the same day, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> That's a fact, by the way. Pigeon Lady and Rat are definitely two of the boxes on the official New Yorker bingo board. So welcome to the Big Apple, Bowen. Funny story there. And finally, Simon Cowell, the America's Got Talent judge, is officially engaged. Finally, People Magazine confirming the news on Tuesday. Cowell and fiance Lauren Silverman went public with their relationship back in 2013. Of course, they share seven-year-old son Eric together. So we're sending big congratulations out to their growing family. All right, those are your headlines for today when we come back nanny star fran drescher shares the key to easing her anxiety thanks to her furry friend for breaking news in our changing world download the nbc news app we've got a congress that doesn't seem very functional what's this election you're going to look like are we getting ahead of the science are we behind the science how much did this booster confusion set us back can the january 6th committee come up with anything that would change republican minds if it's sunday it's meet the press the Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. Did you know that Fran Drescher is a huge dog lover? She's even had a famous one of her own. Get this, Chester, you might recall, the dog on her hit show, The Nanny, was actually Fran's dog. And she told us all about that and how her pets have shaped her life for our My Pet Tale series. I starred on The Nanny and I wrote a part for my first dog ever, Chester Drescher. Oh, Chester, I haven't seen you in such a long time. Nanny Fine, please, he doesn't like strangers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chester was an amazing dog because he was extremely consistent in his behavior. We knew what he would do under certain circumstances. So we wrote towards that. And that was why every time, you know, Cece Babcock grabbed him away from me, we knew that he would growl. Oh, how thoughtful. Mm. <laughs> so we always had her do that. You need some time to get used to you. I mean, you can't expect a dog to just jump into your arms and love you at first sight. Mr. Sheffield. Oh, you got her a puppy. Oh, how sweet. Oh, look how friendly he is. And it was great working with him because he was always on the set anyway. I'm always of the camp, must love dogs. I have a, a dog now, uh, Angel Grace, and I rescued her just days before lockdown. And then she rescued me. And for the first couple of months of our relationship at my house, you know, it was just her and me. I don't think she really uh, knew what was happening. <laughs> But all of a sudden, you know, it was just the two of us for a couple of months. And so it really did bond us. And we're very, very close now. And she's three years old. And I travel with her. And she's 
my service animal. So I'm just very grateful to have the first big dog I've ever had. And, you know, she uh, gives me added security and, uh, and helps me through situations that sometimes would otherwise um, make me anxious. She's kind of different shades of white and bone. And I thought she was so loving when I met her at the rescue place and so sweet uh, that uh, I said, you know, are you an angel? Did Samson send you to me? And Samson was the dog that sadly uh, had died just days earlier uh, from a stroke. I said, are you an angel? Is that your name? And it just seems suitable to her because she is such an angel. She is definitely a big part of the family. She's got all these other mothers who come and take care of her if I have to go out of town and I can't take her with me. Dog is God spelled backwards. And I think that dogs are here to teach us unconditional love, to remind us that there's room in our hearts to love another even if you've loved and lost. And I think that every human should experience unconditional love. It's just a, a bond between two species that really is unparalleled. I just, you know, couldn't live without having a canine to love and care for and feel loved by and share my bed with. Just be there as a friend and a companion and company, a wonderful company. In fact, as a cancer survivor, you know, I always tell other people recently diagnosed, make sure your pet sleeps in the bed with you because at night is when your imagination and fear starts to run wild because you don't have the distractions of the day. And if you don't have a pet, get one. Love talking about dogs. Love hearing people talk about their, they're so passionate about their pets. Coming up on Popstar Plus, Olympic legend, Lindsey Vaughn. I'm not sure if she has an animal or not, but she tells us about her new memoir after this. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We're back now. Three-time Olympic medal winner royalty, Lindsey Vaughn, retired from skiing in 2019. And when she did, she's the most decorated skier of all time female. Now in a new memoir, she pulls back the curtain on what her life is really like. And she spoke about it on Today.
She's won 82 World Cup wins, 20 World Cup titles. She's got three Olympic medals to her name. And now, guys, she's peeling back the curtain on her remarkable life and career. It's a new memoir. It's called Rise, My Story. What a beautiful title, Lindsay. It's so good to see you. And as I'm looking at you, I'm thinking of like America looking at Lindsay Vaughn and saying, wow, talk about somebody who has it all. Talk about someone who's had a charmed life. Talk about someone who seems without care or worry. But when you page through the pages of Rise, you learn all of the vulnerabilities, the depression you battled. And I was just thinking, was it cathartic to finally say, hey, this is me? To your point, everyone thinks that you know, life is great. I have success. You know, everything is perfect. But first of all, no one is perfect. And I definitely am not. You know, I've had my struggles. You know, obviously, I've crashed many times in my career. I've come back from many, many injuries. But I also had personal struggles. And um, most of which I talk about, you know, some things I don't, like my relationships. But you know, for me, my story, it, it was really important for me to get out my story, you know, after retiring from my skiing career and really being able to close that chapter, so to speak, of my life and move forward. Let's talk about battling depression. It happened when you were a teenager. It kind of hit you and your parents split up. And I don't think, I, th I think when people think of depression, they don't know how bad it can get. If you were to try to put your finger on how bad it got, what would that be? I mean, I definitely, you know, struggled and, and when I was a teenager, I had a very hard time. Um, and then I, I got through it, you know, I, I, I got medication and um, saw a therapist and things like that. And it really reared its head most of the time when I was injured, especially after my second ACL surgery and I was missing the Sochi Olympics and, um, you know, I was very isolated and just very depressed. But um, I had a great support system and that's really what mm -hmm. got me through it, you know, being able to lean on other people and, and also being able to talk openly about it, you know, after uh, the, in 2012, I actually talked openly about it and I felt like that really opened the door for me. It was a huge weight off my shoulders. And again, now writing this book, it feels mm -hmm. like an even bigger weight's been, been taken off my shoulders. Well, I picture you at the top of the hill, you know, and a lot of people are battling nerves and expectations. You're battling depression and other things as well. But there you were with all those titles we just read, with all of this excellence. So it just struck me that you were able to maintain excellence despite all of these sort of monkeys that you had on your back. I mean, skiing was the one thing that I really, that could make me happy, you know, and that was my escape, my emotional escape, my physical escape, you know, everything that I, all of the emotions that I was going through, I really put into my skiing and I used that in so many ways as my therapy and also as a crutch. And I think that's why retiring was so hard for me because I no longer had that crutch to lean on, you know, I, I really was, was stuck with my own emotions and my own thoughts and um, sometimes being alone can be very a very scary place. So, um, you know, I, again, it was good for me to reflect and process all of that and be able to now have the skills to, to cope with everything mm -hmm. that I deal with without using skiing in, in that way. A lot of women will be able to relate to this. You have confidence at work. On the slopes, you like, I got this. A lot of women have confidence at work. But when it comes to personal relationships, it's like the confidence just evaporates. We don't know where it goes. And that same thing happened with you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like I was so much in control of my skiing career, but when it came to my personal life, I was very much a passenger. And I think I, I chose to shy away from conflict. You know, I don't, I don't like um, getting an argument, so I tend to be very passive and, and not stand up for what I want and what I need. And I think also, too, because I was so focused on skiing, I didn't know exactly what I wanted and what I needed. So um, it's been a it's been a good maturing process for me these these few years since retiring. And now, you know, I feel like I finally really happy because I know who I am <laughs> without skiing and I know what I want and I can stand up for that. Well, I think we just read your titles. I'll just say them again. 82 World Cup wins, 20 World Cup titles, three Olympic medals, seven world champion uh, chip medals. People would have asked you, Lindsay Vaughn, who are you? And you probably would have said skier. So today, if I were to ask the question, Lindsay Vaughn, who are you? What would your answer be? 
Uh, I'm just a Minnesota girl that loves to work hard. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm a happy, lucky person. I'm not a skier anymore, but um, I definitely am, am a very motivated and, and uh, hardworking person. That's well, it. Eyes don't lie. Eyes don't lie, and your eyes are telling the truth. Lindsay, uh, it's a great book. A lot of people should read it. It's not really about skiing. It's about overcoming. I think it's something that all of us can use. Always great to hang with our friend, Lindsay. Coming up now, we're going to celebrate one of the stars of the show, About Nothing, Seinfeld, next. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd Cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd Cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Hey guys, welcome back to Popstar Plus. Julie Louis-Dreyfus, of course, is comedy gold, an icon, and she uh, is beloved for playing Elaine on Seinfeld. We know that, and as she turns 61 tomorrow, we thought it'd be fun to dig up some seinfeld theme memories from our vault, and so we have to start with Uncle Al's guest appearance on Seinfeld back in 1993. <laughs> It's my big break, my acting debut, a shot at stardom. Okay, so it's a couple of lines on a Seinfeld episode. I showed up early so I could get some tips. You know, what's my motivation? Am I a method actor? How should I play the scene? It's really just pretending. That's it. Yeah, that's really all there is to it. That's the secret. Yeah. All the technique and the motivation and the, the uh, you know, dredging up your prior life experience. Forget, Forget that. It. No, just pretend. Okay, Jerry's good, but let's face it, he's a comedian. Now, Jason Alexander, we're talking Tony Award-winning actor here. And one thought that sh should be going through your head at all times uh -huh. please, God, don't let me screw it up. That's basically, uh, you know, if you, if you take all the acting training that I've had and you distill it down to that, that's basically what I do at every performance is, please, God, don't, don't let me screw it up. up. That's it. And it's held me in good stead. So that, that you, you would recommend that? That's Just think, exactly don't let me screw I'll up. I'll tell you one other tip. Okay. If the scene is essentially over, but uh -huh. the camera's still lingering, there's going to be a moment where you don't know what to play. Uh -huh. And if you just play, who passed when? Okay. It will look something like this. It'll be... About, uh, hey, Tom. And it's good for any situation. It covers everything, you know? It could be somebody could have said, Al, I love you. Okay, Wayne. It's yours, Wayne. How about Andy Williams? It covers everything. Well, I will personally go to Queens and deliver his Al Roker TV guide to him. What'd you do with the one you took? I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to give too much away, but part of this episode's plot involves me on the cover of TV Guide. Notice some resemblance? This Hollywood stuff is fun, but hey, I'm not taking it too seriously. I'm just looking at it as a learning experience. Well, time to rehearse. I hope I remember my lines. All two of them. Elaine! Now, now you saw me rehearse. Do you think I have potential here? Or? No, I don't, Al. No, none, I don't. Of, none of... None. Nothing. No, you're... You're talentless, Al. What do you really feel? You're talentless, Al. I just, I don't have a... I, there's not... You don't have a prayer. Not even to go. Have a good show tonight, though. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks Thumbs for... up. 
for the Today Show. Thanks for the support. As we get ready to film the show, I'm starting to feel a little nervous, but I'm sure the cast feels the same way. Do, do they get nervous before they go on? Or? No, excited. Excited? Yeah, there's some excitement that happens. Excitement. Very rarely is it nervousness. Mm -hmm. It's nice. It's kind of a nice rush. They don't get like a sick to their stomach feeling? Never. No. Okay. No, I think they're well beyond that. Then I guess I have the flu. And as himself, from New York, Al Roker! <laughs> And of course, our regulars as Kramer, Michael Richards, as Elaine, Julia Louis Dreyfus, as George, Jason Alexander. Who else can play George? It's hey. showtime. Elaine! <laughs> yes, your boyfriend's gonna have to catch the next train. He's not my boyfriend. He's not? Interesting. <laughs> For today, I'm out of That is so fun to watch. How amazing is Uncle Al? Finally, here's Julia speaking to us here on our home turf today, back in 1998. We begin with Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who recently told me how much she enjoyed playing Elaine. You know, I, I've been working long enough to know that all the elements don't come together like this every day and so it's been a fabulous role and I'm sure that there are other great roles out there but my god this has been sublime. I have to tell you I love Elaine. I think she is so great. Thank and, you. Um, <laughs> I love you Elaine. What is it about her? I love her? you Katie. <laughs> Thank you. What is it about her though that makes her I mean, really, don't you hear that from so many women? Men, men too, although a certain kind of man. Yeah, a um, man that you don't want to be near. I mean, what do people say to you when they talk about, about her and your character? Maybe she, she says what so many women would like to say. Maybe that's it. Yeah. You know, maybe everybody wants to say, get out, and push somebody away. And because she, she does do what you wish you could do, you know? I hate that question when people say, who's your favorite interview, because they're always, they're always going to say me. Yeah, always. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then they get their feelings hurt. Of course. You don't want to hurt their feelings. Drive this right. <laughs> but um, when you think about moments that were just great for you and your character and fun to do, and you knew it would, was really working. Oh, I've had so many moments like that, because they've, I've, I've been so lucky to have the opportunity to do so many different comedic beats, so to speak. The dance was fun to do, although humiliating, but fun. Sweet fancy Moses. Can you really dance, by the way, Elaine? I mean, Julia? <laughs> yes, I like to think that I can really dance. I don't really dance like that, if that's what you mean. You that's don't? not my real dancing. No. I've been actually doing the, the Elaine dance the last two days. Oh, I'd like and to I see that. I think I have it down pretty well. Well, but... I'll be the judge of that. Yeah. Well, no, because that has a, like, just sort of, so like, no, see, you're too fluid already. It's gotta <laughs> be jerky. Okay, so. And then just do that at the same time. Yeah, that's not bad. Do it a little more. So, like you're listening to music. And do, just make everything. Yeah, that's pretty good. And then go, uh, like that. What sort of things would you like to do next? I can't even tell you. I, I need to take a breather, you know? I've been working hard for so many years. Um, I'm not going to do television. Why um, not? Well, because I've done it, you yeah. know, and this has been so good. And I don't want to sully that, you know. I, I think that I should leave that as a sort of a treasure, treasure and just let it be. There you go. That is some nice nostalgia for you today. Listen, we appreciate you watching Popstar Plus today. We know you have choices in Popstar material, but thank you for choosing us tomorrow. We're going to catch up with two star from the Netflix hit Cheer. We'll see you then. Have a great day.
Oh, wait a minute. You showed up again? Hi, you guys. Hello. Welcome to all of you watching our favorite streaming channel. We like to call it Today All Day. It's Today All Day because all morning is not enough anymore. <laughs> We're halfway through the week, Hodes. You're in Studio 1A. I'm home. I miss you. But we are together in our digital show today in 30, and it's a packed half hour coming It away. is. I miss you, too. We're going to start off by focusing on a big question tied to Omicron's rapid surge. So is it time to upgrade our masks? The CDC is weighing some new changes, and we'll bring you the full report and everything you need to know. All right, then. We got to catch up with our friends Bodie and Morgan Miller as they introduced us to their adorable new bundle of joy, Baby Girl. She's number eight. You mm. don't want to miss our conversation with them. Can't wait. And we had some major star power in the fourth hour. Oscar winner Denzel Washington joined us along with some of his co-stars from the new movie he has out. It's actually an old story, The Tragedy of Macbeth. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of that yeah. story, actually. Oh. Also, can't wait to get hair and makeup again. Doing this one, <laughs> look at my hair. It's sticking it looks out. good. I like it's it. It's a total mess. You know what, though? I know that Today in 30 viewers is very understanding, so thank you. Let's get it started right now. Right now. NBC's Tom Costello's got it all covered for us. Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning. A lot of scrutiny on the White House and the CDC over the shortage of tests, over confusing messaging. This morning, word that the administration is going to start shipping test kits to schools nationwide. And the CDC, as you said, expected to urge all Americans to upgrade our masks as Omicron is spreading unchecked across the country. Overnight, new data showing the highly contagious Omicron variant now makes up almost all new COVID cases in the U.S., a staggering 98 percent. It happened at lightning speed, too, spreading in just over one month. With COVID cases surging and hospitalizations hitting all-time highs, the CDC is now considering whether to update its own mask guidance, potentially recommending Americans choose higher quality options, like N95s or the Chinese-made kn 95 they are really, really tight fitting and they, and they help filter out very small airborne droplets of COVID. The typical surgical mask provides decent protection, but doesn't seal tightly around the nose and mouth. The Biden administration also taking a big step to keep kids in school, announcing this morning it will hand out 5 million rapid COVID tests and another 5 million lab-based PCR tests to schools nationwide every month for free. Meanwhile, the nation's top health officials faced a grilling on Capitol Hill. Tuesday's testimony punctuated by this very concerning message. Most people are going to get COVID. The experts were blasted over their mixed messaging and criticized for their confusing changes in guidelines. The American people are right to be confused. It seems like you all don't talk amongst yourself. Lawmakers also demanded answers over the critical test shortage. Our frustrated constituents cannot find rapid tests. A contentious hearing that turned personal at times. You are totally incorrect. Dr. Fauci clashing with Republican Senator Roger Marshall and later heard on a hot mic. What a moron. Jesus Christ. Senator Rand Paul and Fauci also sparring again. You're not an objective scientist. You, you've lost that long ago. Fauci accused a Kentucky Republican of putting him, Fauci, in danger, citing a case last month of an armed man arrested with a hit list. The police asked him where he was going, and he was going to Washington, D.C. to kill Dr. Fauci. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. 
Allie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. Well, Bodie and Morgan Miller have been our cherished friends here on Today for years. And last month, we were so thrilled to announce that their family had grown yet again as they welcomed a new baby girl. Well, we're going to catch up with the Millers live in just a moment. But first, the journey to what they say has now completed their family. It's been just five weeks since Bodie and Morgan Miller welcomed a little girl to their family. Her arrival at home on November 26th, an early Christmas gift and a blessing they've been dreaming of. Baby girl makes eight, joining big sister Dace and big brothers Nate, Nash, Easton, twins Asher and Axel, and of course their sister Emmy, who died in a tragic drowning accident three and a half years ago. She would now be five years old. There's this undercurrent of, of sort of loss that's just never gonna go away. Through their tears, the Millers have made it their mission to educate parents about the importance of water safety training for kids so no other family goes through what they have. If your child is crawling, they should be floating. If your child is walking, they should be swimming. Helping them heal now, a new baby girl, a wish come true, as they told us in 2019 after their twin boys were born. Do you all have like a Christmas wish? An unrealistic one, another little girl. <laughs> Baby girl Miller still doesn't have a name. Mom and dad say they've been waiting to see how her tiny personality develops, something of a Miller family tradition. They've been calling her Ocho, Spanish for number eight. Though Morgan writes they have been toying with the idea of incorporating some part of Emmy's name. The Millers say the latest addition to the family will be the last. Their family is now complete. From the heartbreak to the joy, we have been along for the journey. I am so nervous. Bodie and I have no idea. We were there last May when they learned the gender of the newest baby. The moment bittersweet. Oh my God! At the time, Morgan writing, I've dreamt of this moment for a long time and have longed to be able to hold a little girl again. My heart feels overwhelmingly full for the first time in a long time, and I have no doubt that my angel in heaven has her hand in this. To my Ocho, we have all been waiting for you. Have we ever and joining us now from their very full house in Montana? We've got Bodie Morgan and baby girl Miller. Good morning, Miller family. Good morning. Oh, Good morning. That was a great little early. piece. Yeah. Oh, I know I'm crying too, because after all these years that, that we've been together and all the ups and downs, and you guys have just been so sweet to share your hearts. Um, and now this little heart in your hands, baby nut girl. What's she like? Tell us about her. Yeah, she's so <laughs> she's so um, similar to to the way Emmy was, but really mm -hmm. unique as well. Like so, really relaxed. Her whole birth was obviously we've done them at home, and this one, both Morgan and I afterwards were like, "Wait, did that just happen?" It like <laughs> she, it was like, "Okay, I think the baby's coming," and then she was late, so we were all kind of like really excited to meet her, and then. It just went along and then she came out and we were like, oh, now there's a baby here. It was it was so strange and surreal for me because I'd, you know, obviously dealt with the twins the last time, which was mind blowing. And uh, she's been <laughs> that way since. She just fits right in. All the boys fawn over her all the time and and uh, they're super gentle. and Everyone's been really exciting. I mean, excited, but mm. it's I don't know. It's It's hard because her personality is different. And I think we're all trying to get used to it, but um, she's stumped us on names so far. We have a lot that we like, but she hasn't like, <laughs> she hasn't like smiled or like high-fived or anything when we, when we say them. We say them to her all the time, but she, she seems to just kind of do that. I yeah, know, Morgan, I was really, really I was, sweet. I was like teasing you guys in the, during the commercial because, you know, mm -hmm. when you give birth at home, you don't have to name the baby right away. If you give birth in the hospital, you got to do that birth certificate or they don't let you leave. So now it's been seven weeks. And I, I actually think it's wonderful. And I love that you guys want to get to know her and see, like, who's she going to be? But, you know, the clock is ticking at some point. This was supposed to be the deadline today. Yeah, we, we, we've been feeling it. Um, 
But it is. I mean, <laughs> as you know, right? Like, I honestly, I've known you, Savannah, for, I don't know, 20, 20 years, maybe more. And I, I can't imagine you as anybody else. And I think I feel the same way about my name. I feel the same way about Morgan. So it really is an important thing that I feel like, um, yeah, almost she has to have input. Your daughter came up with an exceptional suggestion. Um, she did. My little daughter just said baby lavender, which I think yeah. is actually quite cute. Um, what are some cute. other front runners? So we've definitely narrowed it down. Uh, um, our three front runners are Skylar, Scarlett, and calling her Letty, or Olivia and calling her Liv all kind of have a special meaning to it. So we may have to reach out to our social media following today <laughs> and ask for some assistance because <laughs> she has not really been giving us many answers. And it, it's been cool to be up here in, in Big Sky in Montana because the feel, the whole, is different than obviously all the other ones we've been in California. And we're sort of, I'm sort of hoping that something very Montana, very Big Sky comes to us mm. that, that fits her. But um, I'm a huge fan of Liv, uh, Olivia. It's a little bit frustrating that it's like one of the most popular names this year <laughs> um, because most of the names of our children aren't, aren't terribly popular. But um, we're not going to let that stand in the way, obviously. No, no. When she lets you know, she'll let you know. And she will, of course, be so precious and unique. And Morgan, I just, after all these years of us talking, I just know how much a little girl meant to you. I um, remember being in Emmy's room with you. And yeah. just if you can put into words what it's like to hold that little girl again and have that, that little girl magic in your life. It's going to make me cry. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, complete. It's... So full and so complete. You know, we have a we have a lot of boys, <laughs> yeah. um, and and you you know, Emmy was such a great balance because she was such a powerhouse. And then when she passed, it was um, it was shocking because you really felt this energetic shift in the house. I mean, obviously we were all suffering and everything too, but there was just this this gap there for all the boys, and and now they have this little girl to kind of like it just makes them gentle. You'd be yeah. blown away. I mean, they, they always, you know, they, they, they know like, Oh, tell you, we have a video from yesterday that maybe we'll send you, um, that they were just wanting to hold her. No, is it my turn? Is it my turn? But then they hold her and they're, you can see that they're like trying to be as gentle as they can. Whereas with okay. each other, they're like, they just roughhouse and like <laughs> basically are relentless. So, um, it really is. I mean, that's a great example right there. It's like, you know, she, the one holding her is like, oh boy, oh boy. And everyone else is like, you know, WWF. So, um, it, it, it feels, I think maybe I was more excited even than Morgan, although maybe not, it's, it's impossible to, to sort of surpass her excitement, but we both, um, I think maybe underestimated the importance of this for everyone else as well. Both, are all of our parents and our surrounding, you know, yeah. group of friends. Cause My dad. like everybody really, really was um, impacted by both the loss of Emmy and the, the joining of this little one. Oh man, we needed her light, didn't we? Bodie and Morgan, it's so good to catch up with you. Love seeing you so happy. Um, and you know, I guess keep us posted. Send me a text. Let me know. I love playing the baby naming game. <laughs> Lavender is available and quite unusual. I know. It actually really does sound nice. Um, <laughs> right. We will. We will absolutely let you know. Thank you. It's yeah. great to see you both. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. We are back with our series Clean Sweep, and this morning we're focusing on the heart of the house, the kitchen. Mm. Chef and TV host Elena Be What noise was that? <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm sorry. Elena Besser is here uh, with some squeaky clean <laughs> solutions. Hi, Elena. How are you? Get Hello, everyone. I'm great. How are you? Doing great. Good. Good to see you. Wish you were here in person. But before we start scrubbing, what are some <laughs> basic things that we should all, you know, restock or refresh this time of year? Yes, absolutely. So the number one thing is go through your pantry, go through your refrigerator, check the expiration dates. One of my favorite things I learned when working in a restaurant kitchen was using tape and a Sharpie to label the expiration date. Oh, Surprisingly, idea. things are going to expire faster than you may think, and you really want to refresh. The other thing is condensed pantry items. Make sure if you have two bags of flour lying around, you take the older one, pour it on top mm. of the newer ones. You can use that first. And of course, get some new cleaning supplies. You deserve it. If you're the one cleaning, get a fresh sponge, you know, get some new dish rags. You got it. <laughs> hey, speaking of cleaning supplies, uh, Elena, you say before you go out and buy a bunch of stuff, there's some, there's some great DIY cleaners you can make with what we've already got underneath the sink or in the pantry. Oh, absolutely, Al. Surprisingly, the four things that are great DIY cleaners you probably already have lying around in your house. Vinegar, lemon, rock salt, and baking soda. So let's talk about the garbage disposal. I love to take an ice cube tray, pour some vinegar in it, rock salt, some sliced lemons, freeze it, and then put it in my garbage disposal, run the water, and what it's going to do is it is going to clear out all of that grime and grease buildup so your garbage disposal works prime. Okay, this one is a little, I know that there's some controversy in the Melvin household around whether to rinse your dishes before there's no putting controversy. them in the dishwasher. There, there actually is. There's no controversy there because is. I know that you're not supposed to. No. It wastes water, I'm right? going to clarify something real quick because you need to know this. He, okay. he means when not rinsing, he means actually leaving the chunks of the food oh, on. I, I just, no, you, oh, no, you do. No. Right. Well, so. what, what, okay, sorry, go ahead, Lindsay. No, 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 that's it. You have it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, I love it. I think that here's the deal. <laughs> Whatever your choice is, let's just make sure that your dishwasher is operating to the best of its ability. So here's how to do it. You're going to take a little bit of baking soda, about a cup or so, put it in the bottom of your dishwasher, let that sit overnight. You want to make sure the dishwasher is empty. Then the next day, you're going to run it on the hottest setting. Oh. Once it fills up with water after a couple of minutes, open it up and then pour in two cups of vinegar and finish running that cycle. Just like with the garbage disposal, the baking soda and the vinegar are going to unclog yeah. the Never bottom, make it operate as best as it possibly can. And then, you know what, Craig, if you're not in the mood to rinse off that dish, hopefully the dishwasher will get the job done because it is squeaky clean. What, okay, what, wait, 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 what wait. do you do? Well, yeah, I, if they're chunks, I, get, I just give it a quick wipe uh, because eventually all those chunks get into the filter, the dishwasher starts to smell, or, and it's not running at, at uh, optimum Or capacity. you open it when it's clean and the chunks are still there in the bottom. But uh, so oh, anyway, we, we, we digress. Yeah, and, but I, <laughs> you, you did kind of dodge it. So who's right? <laughs> you know what, Lindsay, I appreciate your squeaky clean approach. And I got to give you a shout out for that. Um, but honestly, as long as your dishwasher is operating to the best of its ability, <laughs> it just de it depends on the fit. It depends on what food's on it. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. This I is why you I are so good at your job. Seriously. Thank you. It's a draw. It's right. a draw. It's a draw. <laughs>
<laughs> what about the cookware? Cookware may okay. also need a facelift. What, what tricks do you have for that? Oh, yeah, it absolutely does. So the deal with cleaning cookware, I actually picked this tip up from my father-in-law. He's a master cleaner. What he loves to do is he loves to take a little bit of baking soda on a sheet tray and then put um, some dish soap on it, scrub it into a paste, and then you're going to put a layer of paper towel over it and then soak that in vinegar. Depending on how intense the stains are, you want it to sit for about 15 minutes and honestly up wow. to overnight. And wow. then what you're going to do is you're going to take that paper towel and you're going to wipe away those stains it's actually unbelievable how well this trick works it has completely transformed my baking sheets wow. the wow. other crazy cool. thing is you're gonna want it surprisingly for stains and scorched burns on pots mm. you're going to want to look to your laundry room hello dryer sheet mm. so what i love to do is i actually will take a dryer sheet yeah. put it into a pot with a little bit of dish soap and some warm water and then you're going to let it sit for at least an hour. And what's going to happen is the dryer sheet is going to help pull away those ugly stains and you are going to be left with a beautiful pot that looks good as new that you'll be proud Look to display that. on your kitchen. I mean, you, these have been really, some mind-blowing tips. That's right. Unfortunately, Thanks, we've got guys. a bounce now, Elena. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, it's okay. Well, oh, there are more was, tips where that no, came no, from. No, no, don't encourage that. <laughs> that. No, but actually, those would be great um, things to do with kids. Like, I could see our kids getting into the baking sheet Thing, you know. Nah, oh, yeah. Kids know that. <laughs> Elena, thank you. Thank you, Elena. Come thank back. Thank you so much. That was great. great. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right. I love that. It. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We began our Cross America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin, here in Nashville, from Washington, D.C., the side of our nation's capital you rarely see. This is your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Okay, what is your favorite Denzel Washington film? Oh, there's so many. I think these might surprise you because these are not the marquee ones that everyone has probably chosen. My favorite, and I remember seeing it in a movie theater, was Pelican Brief with Julia Ooh. Roberts. How good was it? By the way, the John Grisham movies were crazy, uh, and that one in particular. I loved it. I love a sports movie. You do. I could cry for a sports movie. Remembering the Titans, oh. T.C. Williams. Yes! What? Hear ye, hear ye, we are in presence of greatness. Oscar winner, Denzel Washington. Yeah, Denzel's getting rave reviews for his role as the ambitious and murderous Macbeth in the new film, The Tragedy of Macbeth. Take a look. Come to Dunsinane and thou oppose, being not a woman born, yet I will try the last. Leon Macduff. And damn be him that first cries, old enough. Whoa. Wow. Okay, he joins us now alongside his incredibly talented co-stars, Corey Hawkins and Moses Ingram, who play Macduff and Lady Macduff. Hey, everyone. First of all, good morning. And you would normally start with the Oscar winner himself, but I instead want to start with Corey and Moses because, Moses, would you please tell us what it's like to work with the very talented Denzel Washington? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Denzel. It's a lot like that. It's like I am actually odd at it. I was like, God really made a power play. He was like, you know what? 
I'm going I'm to give you a little some, some early. But I, I, I felt really blessed to be in his presence and to um, learn and receive of his generosity. Yeah, yeah I know I have. Corey, the language in Shakespeare, again, is for some people look in, and are intimidated. So when you got uh, your lines, obviously, um, how did you like how did you approach it? Um, well, first of all, good morning. Good morning, um, good morning to you. <laughs> thanks for having us. Um, for a lot of people, it can feel a little bit ostracizing. And, and for me, my, my sort of hook has always been music and in the same way, you know, you listen to a piece of classical music and you might not catch every, you know, sonic change or you listen to a piece of hip hop and you might not catch every lyric, but you feel it. Um, that's that's what Shakespeare is for me, you know, the poetry of it all. And so, you know, working on it with these actors, it was just like it was a dream come true because it just starts to sing. Wow. Uh, Denzel, you your daughter worked on this show. Your son is, we were just talking about him in the commercial break. Uh, Alan Craig were saying, oh my God, I love Denzel's son. He's so great in every movie he's in. How do you take that role as like proud dad? It must feel pretty good. Well, uh, we're just working actors. You know, my, my Olivia, my daughter is uh, on her way. Why can't I forget which one's where. One is working in New Orleans. That's Olivia. <laughs> Uh, Katya is producing a movie in New Mexico, and John David is in Indonesia as we speak. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Or Bangkok, where he is, Thailand. Was, was there ever a moment where you said to them, you know, acting can be tricky, mm -hmm. acting can be hard, like you gotta, or were you always like go for your dreams? I had Olivia audition for me, show me her audition piece. And I told her, I said, you know, you, it's going to be, number one, you're very good, mm. but it's going to be tougher for you. It's going to be tough for you. You know, just try to be honest with them about the business. Corey, you know, this is a spoiler alert, but many of us studied Shakespeare or, or at least tried. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you have the, the, I guess, the predicament of killing an, an icon, <laughs> yeah. killing an Oscar winner. <laughs> so how did you prepare for this fight? Were you intimidated? Were you like, no, man, I, I, I can't be Denzel, you know? <laughs> what did you do? Yeah, see, right there, right there, that moment right there, I was just thinking, Lord, please, please, don't, 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 don't hit him, don't hit him, you know? Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's just, it's crazy because they, they uh, Joel, you know, he's an incredible director and visionary, um, but, you know, the interesting thing is to put sort of obstacles in these actors' way and, and uh, and he put us in this tiny sort of parapet wow. with these huge, real broadswords. <laughs> and um, and I think our first time doing it was on the day, actually. So, you know, we had rehearsed it separately and then came together to do it. And so I was just nervous. <laughs> Honestly, I was just nervous. Denzel, I feel like these young actors are looking up to you and I'm marveling at it. He I think cheated. I look, yeah. He cheated. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they're marveling at you and they're like, you know, in your shadow and trying to drink it all in. And when we spoke about the passing of Sidney Poitier, I felt like the roles were reversed. Mm. It was your turn to look up to someone and marvel and, and want to draw what you could draw from them. Um, uh, how did how did Sidney Poitier shape you? Well, he, he was just the the well, I won't even say he was the only example because I, I, I came up in the theater. So I was watching James Earl Jones at the same time. Mm. You know, Sidney was just in a in a lane by himself and there was no one ever like him before him or since. Mm. Yeah. Well, we want to thank you guys all for being with us. Uh, this is big. Uh, it's called The Tragedy of Macbeth. I know y'all are doing a lot of press. Good luck. Yes, we wish you good luck with the movie. Congrats. We hear some Oscar buzz, yeah. which we're into. We, we like buzz, yeah. all of it. All right, it's in select <laughs> theaters now. Premieres on Apple TV Plus this Friday. Thank you guys again. We appreciate Thank your time you this morning. for waking up so no. early. Uh, the other side. Uh, yeah, yeah that, 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 you know that, what? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, don't worry about it. We're going to be back for another great morning tomorrow. Bobby Flay will be here. He's cooking up some winter pasta that your whole family will love. Have a great day. Have a great hair day in every other way as well. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.
New York City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wound eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels, rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels, and of course you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. I about the salmon and cream cheese together. Like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, Al. how are you? Welcome to the Russell Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. Great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So, this is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for you, because you usually would see so-and-so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he'd had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank like, goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Hattie, Ida, and Anne. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. your boss. Yeah, and I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family, and that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Patty, Ida, and Anne became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start and so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home when you don't have running water or when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. 
I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah. yeah. First of all, Ross and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish. When we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon, but sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know the cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man who delivered it. All right, it just did too. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just did. In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side. And she once said that before she knew the word feminist, 
When she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression. Uh, you're here in the, the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that, you know, people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and locks and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's, it's almost Look at translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get it that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right, so, so uh, I watch people slice and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish which is a very difficult concept to train yeah, someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices are, mm. don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. Are you so, making faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should, you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Al. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very... Drastically, more than a, you think. That's more than... Oh, my gosh. That's a very thick... We call those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say, that sound... That, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. Yeah. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture, which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into locks. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We began our Cross America journey tonight. St. Louis, Austin. Here in Nashville. From Washington, D.C. The side of our nation's capital you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> was talking smack part of this. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? 
Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? I'm here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly eight million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Kaslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out, he of, went, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers, like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step? cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon, uh -huh. it's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right, so what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, just do your bullet. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Good. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Underneath. And we're going to lay it onto this the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're going to grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll. Give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally, we would probably dry, uh, wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish. But for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. OK. That's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours 
This process imparts a subtle, smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So, these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the you oven? You bet. All right. All right. Hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. And now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the US. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? We began our Cross America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin, here in Nashville, from Washington, D.C., the site of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year gonna look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Back on the Lower East Side, two sisters inspired by their Jewish heritage are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom, you. wanna show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cream cheese. They wanna make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? They are, yes. About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So. We decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, was a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know <laughs> why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. We're watching climate change happen right now, and 
I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and moxie was going to be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty lox. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. And so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for. So we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there. Okay, so let's get started. I'm, I'm really it. fascinated. Okay, by all right, I'm excited. So we have prepared, what do we have, maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you. These are huge, these would have been huge carrots. Seriously, yeah, like wow. the size of my forearm. But you <laughs> you have you have sliced them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. So this this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm, interesting. Oh, no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling I'm, it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's going to have to kill me. <laughs> so I'm just going to start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. Is another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot you. of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba? Yeah. Are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you got to drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's, like, it's bean water. It's bean, bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pour, okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we toss them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking just ah. to sound like classy. Okay. Like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashew, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Chai this is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. Okay, a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future! <laughs> A bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City.
Good morning. Overwhelmingly Omicron. Health officials announcing the new COVID strain now accounts for 98% of all cases in the U.S. The head of the FDA putting it bluntly. Most people are going to get COVID. This morning, living with this new reality and the CDC considering changing its own guidance to recommend all Americans wear 